let me first wish you a happy new year fuel of opportunity of course and new stimulating scientific ideas we had uh, at score last month's discussion with arnaud fontanet with in 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 a, in a, in a, in a workshop quite similar to this one, Arnaud Fontani is from the Institute Pasteur, and we were talking about the perspectives of the pandemic and more especially on, on the perspective of the Omicron. Unfortunately, things happened as anticipated by scientific and by Arnaud with a variant which is much less lethal, but much more contagious than the former variants. Today, we organize a, a scientific with, with Toulouse uh, School of Economics and more especially with the share risk value and, and market and a, a workshop on long term care and aging. Uh, the share uh, of uh, between SCORE and uh, to, supported by SCORE at the Toulouse School of Economics is, is a long standing share because it begins in 2007 and uh, he has therefore a long tradition, uh, more quite uh, 15 years, and uh, it has been very fruitful. And uh, on the side of SCORE, we have been very, very much satisfied by the activity and all the ideas we have been able to share thanks to the academics and which have been feeding uh, the business. Uh, I will leave thereafter Stefan Wilner present to us, uh, with more uh, precision the avenues of the research we agreed on for the coming years. But let me say that long-term care and aging is a very hot topic currently in advanced economies. These topics are even more challenging as we don't know so much on uh, these topics. It's a new experience by, in many dimensions. Many proposals, political proposals, have been put forward that seem to ignore the basics of behavioral theory and empirics of aging. At the same time, Insurers lament the lack of demand for long-term care products, while governments are committed for long to provide such products, but not have done anything, at least in France, for example. The workshop is organized around the keynote and the presentation of five scientific papers. Let me just a few words on that. Firstly, in his important keynote, Pierre Pestiot from the University of Liège gave us an overview of recent research on long-term care. I think it's very important for many persons coming from the business to have an overview because it is what they are lacking uh, of. Uh, then uh, Olga Strulik from the University of Göttingen, if I have good understood, uh, will uh, look more in the detail of his care, the, the expenditures and the elasticity to the increase in life expectancy while Clara uh, Kanta of the Toulouse Business School uh, will consider a theoretical bargaining model with uh, gender differentiation and therefore include the consequence uh, of gender in the results of the model. Tatiana Korichkova from Concordia University in the, in the US built on an equilibrium uh, model for nursing home care market that, and that aims to quantitatively evaluate the effects of long-term care policies, which is important for businesses and also for civil servants. For those who are connected and are civil servants, it's very important. While Mathieu Lefebvre from Ex Marseille uh, School of Economics uh, checks a very hot topic currently, especially in France, because of a, of a public debate on the subject on whether nursing homes were lending themselves to excessive excess mortality. Uh, Jean-Marie Lozacmer from the Toulouse School of Economics shows that when singles and couples coexist, gender neutrality limits for the distribution. Uh, in fact, and it will uh, detail uh, in, uh, in, in, in which conditions. I hope you will enjoy this uh, workshop and lend me thanks the Toulouse School of Economics and the Toulouse School of Economics Share for having organized it and all the speakers. And I give now the floor to Stefan Wilnev, uh, 
uh, who leads the Toulouse School of Economics chair on uh, uh, risk, value, and market. You have the floor. So thank Stephane. you, Philippe. Thank you. Uh, so I am uh, Stefan Villeneuve, professor of mathematics at TSC. My field of interest is about uh, stochastic modeling, stochastic control, uh, finance, mathematical finance, and I am in charge with uh, Christian Gaulier of the share. So let me quickly uh, take the floor to give an overview of the share uh, to those who have only vaguely heard about it. Okay. So let me share some. Uh, some slides in order to be, I think that I can share this. Yes. So my, uh, as uh, Philippe said, it's a long uh, standing relationship. So 2007, 2008, it depends on the, <laughs> on the time of the, <laughs> I do not remember exactly when we signed the, con the first contract, but it's around that date. And the idea is to support uh, theoretical and applied research on uh, market, insurance markets, risk management, and, and a lot of questions about uh, uh, sharing risk. So our mission is uh, really uh, uh, having a role of uh, helping SCORE to understand how risk uh, transform influence uh, decision making. So it's a general assessment, but if you want to, to have some, um, some uh, idea about what we are doing, we uh, have an annual report of, of the, of, about the work we are doing uh, on, uh, under the edges of this share, uh, available on our website at this, uh, at this address. And this annual report summarizes our activity in terms of paper and highlights the main events like this uh, workshop or any relationship we have with the uh, score teams. So especially with, uh, we have uh, several uh, contribution with uh, several uh, leaders on, on the score. Um, and I will be more specific on this by descri describing the key topics uh, on, uh, on this share. So it, it is just a summary. I, I, I won't be long because I, we are all impatient to listen to the speakers. So, let me give you just uh, three, three points. The first one is about uh, behavioral economics. We are very, very interested in that new uh, trend in, uh, in economics. So a question like, uh, do markets encourage uh, unethical behavior um, are very interesting for us. There is another um, big, big challenge about uh, green investment, so everybody knows. Uh, global warming is a big uh, challenge and we are working our, on, uh, for instance, how to quantify the risk premium associated with the uncertainty associated with the ESG criteria. So generally, uh, we depart from the standard uh, risk uh, versus return uh, problem by adding a third component. And the last bullet is about health economic and aging. And because it's, this is uh, today's topic, I will leave uh, to Pierre the floor to present it, uh, to give us an overview, and I will be very short on this, on that aspect. So I hope that you have a, a better idea of what we are doing in, uh, at TSC uh, on, uh, on uh, research about uh, general risk market, risk sharing, uh, regulation of markets, uh, health economics, and Really, really, I insist if you want to have, uh, uh, I think, the most information are in that uh, website. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure if you, if you are free and, and I will be happy to share uh, your comment if you have any. Okay, so Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank and, you, Stefan. And I will stop to, if I am able to do this, I will stop to share my screen. So where it is, if I do that, yes, that's okay. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, so you can see what I'm going to talk about. It's a quick survey of uh, some recent work on the economics of long-term care. Next, please. Well, as you know, long-term care concern people who depend on help to carry out daily activities. 
It deals mainly with nursing care rather than with health care. However, over the last decade, sorry, over the last decade, improving longevity and medical progress, for example, towards cancers, has led an increase in, co in chronic diseases and thus to dependence requiring both nursing and healthcare. So I will give you an overview of uh, some recent work. Most work is empirical or based on um, calibrated simulations. Here, I focus mostly on theoretical contributions, but which crest which are based on uh, that empirical work. Next, please. Next, sorry, uh, I'm not in control of my, my slides. That's why I have to say uh, the outline. First, I will give a, some evidence. Then I will turn to the three main actors of long-term care, the family. I will give the motives behind the family aid and the collateral effects on family assistance. Then I will turn to the market the so-called LTC insurance puzzle, and then the, the rules of reimbursement. And then finally, I will uh, look at the, the role of the state. Basically, I mean, I will deal with uh, very shortly on the issue of optimal policy given family aid and insurance market. And I will say a few words about uh, some poly political economy models. Next, please. So the background, so long-term care needs are increasing rapidly. The financing course source, well, if I give you an out-of-pocket, I will give you yeah, some, some rough estimation. The fam you have the family support, the public and the private uh, support we get uh, that kind of uh, allocation. You can see that uh, long-term care is basically uh, uh, financed or provided by the family, uh, unlike, I mean, the uh, pensions and healthcare, which rely mostly on the state. So it's quite different. Uh, in looking at that kind of allocation, which is, as I say, I mean, it's really a back of the envelope, estimation, we have to distinguish between uh, provision and financing. For example, we can have a, a public financing and a public and a private provision. So the distinction has to be made. Next, please. First, the family, the main helpers. The main helpers are the spouses and the children and the mainly uh, the, the wives and the daughters. In a recent paper, uh, it has been shown that uh, there is such a thing as a blood and gender bias. What do we mean by that? It means that uh, by blood, we mean that uh, the children will help their parents more easily than their in-laws. And by the gender bias, we mean that uh, a daughter will help her mother more easily than her father. And uh, we can show that uh, such a gender bias and blood bias uh, prevails in all uh, European countries. What are the motives behind uh, the aid to the dependent? Uh, traditionally, we think that people help their parents out of altruism. It has been shown that altruism is just one of the motivation behind aid. Uh, there are two of the motivations which are as important. Uh, first, there is the exchange motivation. I mean, you, you help your parents, but in exchange, you expect them to take care of your, their, their grandchildren. And also, I mean, they provide you some uh, inter vivos uh, transfers and uh, ultimately some bequests. So there is a quid pro quo 
type of contract within the family. And then there is the family norm, which uh, depends uh, clearly on the culture. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising that in the patriot patriarchal culture, as the one uh, which still prevails, I mean, uh, the, women, the, the women are participating more than men in uh, that kind of process of uh, family solidarity. We have shown indeed that uh, the norms are playing a very important role. And uh, why is it important? It's important for two reasons. First, I mean, the, the, the type of, uh, the, 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 the effect of uh, public policy will be different according to the norm. Uh, public policy, for example, will have a coordinated eff effect on uh, family solidarity in case of uh, altruism. But in the case of the family norm, you will not find that kind of coding out effect. Also, uh, the effect, the collateral effect to which I'm going to turn now is going to depend on the type of motif. Uh, that's why we, it's very important to sort out those motifs. Next, please. There are indeed problems with the family, what we can call the collateral effects of family assistance. It has been shown that uh, family care can give, uh, has a number of negative effects. First, on the career of helpers. Uh, quite often, uh, women have to stop working or have to, they have to, to move to a part-time work to help their dependent parents. But more important, uh, informal care has a lot of uh, negative effects on the health of the carers. And it has been shown that the social cost of these uh, effects is as important as the social cost of the, of the dependent, the dependence itself. So it's quite important. Another issue is the the choice between staying home and, uh, and, uh, and going to a nursing home. I mean, this is a very difficult choice. And it's quite important. As you will see in the, the paper presented by uh, Mathieu, uh, countries don't behave the same way towards that issue. There are countries where uh, nursing home tend to be more uh, if I can use the word deadly or lethal than others. Uh, for example, uh, I think we will see that uh, countries such as Belgium, Germany, France uh, tend to be less uh, uh, more, I mean, uh, the, their, their nursing home seems to lead to death uh, more often than staying home. So, I mean, it's quite important. And, uh, there is a recent book in France, I mean, some of you know about it, called uh, The Fossoyeur, which showed that indeed, I mean, those nursing homes can be uh, not very friendly, to say the least. Next, please. Now I move to the market. There is a real puzzle in the way the market behaves. The question is, we, we notice that we have a very thin market for a risk which seems to be perfectly insurable. It concerns everyone and is quite measurable. And so that's why do we have such a thin market? I mean, that market is so thin. I mean, in the US, where the market is the most developed, it uh, concerns only less than 10% of total long-term care spending. And in other countries, it's even below. In some countries, I mean, the market is, the, the long-term care uh, insurance market is in, inexistent. There are various reasons for that puzzle. And let me list them and discuss them. First, they are the uh, high prices, it's very costly. 
uh, it has been shown that uh, the loading costs are very high, particularly for men. That has been shown by several papers by Braun and Finkelstein. Also, there is, and that can be explained by the uh, adverse selection. In fact, it has been shown that uh, individuals have a better information than the uh, insurance agents have better information on uh, their probability of getting dependent and also on the, their possibility of getting some help from the family. And given that asymmetric information, we get precisely, I mean, the adverse selection, uh, which leads to high prices. The family also play a role of substitute and that has been labeled uh, the intra-family moral hazard by Pauli. I mean, the, the point is the following. Parents prefer to have the help of their kids than to go to a nursing home. They know that if they take an insurance, uh, it will be tempting for their, for their kids to send them to a nursing home because that will be uh, less costly. So by not buying, purchasing uh, long-term care insurance, they get uh, a guarantee or more, 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 more guarantee to get uh, help from their children. Another argument is, so another factor is uh, the fact that uh, in all countries, you have some social assistance for, for low-income people. Uh, in a certain way, I mean, uh, the, the, the government is playing the role of a good Samaritan. And that leads the uh, people, not only the poor, but also the middle class, to try to get that kind of social assistance. And therefore, they don't buy the insurance they could buy otherwise. For example, it can be shown that the 20 person of medical, Medicaid expenses, which is uh, the, the, the US uh, social assistance for long-term care, 20% of Medicaid expenses, I think concern people, middle-class people who could very well buy, purchase a private insurance. Another factor is the, the fact that the rules of reimbursement are not terribly attractive. I will, I will turn to that point in the next uh, subsection. There is also the fact that uh, the state, the utility state dependent, it has been shown that uh, it's, there is a possibility that uh, the marginal utility of income would decrease with the severity of dependence. Which, which means that uh, uh, depends that will not be anymore an insurable good. Then there is there are a, a, an array of uh, behavioral biases. One of them is ignorance, ignorance about uh, the, the risk of uh, dependence, ignorance about the cost of dependence. There is also a myopia, which comes from a, a sort of duality. People tend to prefer instant gratification over long-term welfare. And that leads them not to buy any uh, insurance. Finally, I mean, there is the, the fact, I mean, that people don't want to think about uh, what's going to happen when they get old. I mean, there's a sort of denial a denial of uh, death, there is a denial of dependence. And that's another reason why they don't buy purchase insurance. Next, please. Then I would like to say a few words about uh, the rules of reimbursement. There are two types of uh, two main rules of, of uh, reimbursement. One of them is uh, a reimbursement of long-term care uh, expenses. So it means that uh, the actual cost of uh, care is going to be reimbursed, but that reimbursement is limited. There's a ceiling in the amount of the benefits 
in the length of uh, reimbursement, for example, uh, in the US where that rule is uh, applied, it's quite often most uh, insurance policies, I mean, have a, a, a ceiling of two years, which means that after two years, I mean, you have to end up uh, uh, going to Medicaid or you have to, to, to finance your own uh, dependence. The, altern the alternative is a cash indemnity long-term care. Uh, you get uh, a sort of lump sum amount. Uh, it can be on a limited amount of time or it can be forever. Uh, that's more practice today. I mean, that kind of lump sum payment, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's used in, in, in the French market and the US are using it uh, more and more. When, when you look at these uh, rules of reimbursement, you, you understand that they, they are not terribly attractive for, for a lot of uh, individuals. Why? Because there is no protection against a too long and costly period of dependence. For the insurer, it limits the uncertainty of long-term risks, but uh, that's for the insurer. For the insurance, insure, there is uh, that problem of a limited reimbursement period or the limited amount of uh, reimbursement. Next, please. I show you here some data which are coming from the US and which shows you, which show the length of uh, dependence for people who are above 65. And you can see that the uh, for men, there are 9.8% 9, 9 of people who will de be dependent for five and plus years. And women, they will be sitting, almost 18% will be dependent for more than uh, five years. That's quite a lot. And it shows why a limited uh, reimbursement period uh, raise some problem. And it has been shown by uh, several authors that in fact, uh, it would be uh, more efficient to turn to a, to a policy, insurance policy, which would uh, include a deductible. Uh, I mean, the deductible principle has been shown to be uh, an efficient way of insuring individuals by Kenneth Arrow a long time ago. Concerning the lump sum uh, formula, uh, it has been shown uh, by uh, Kramer et al. that uh, it can be justified on theoretical grounds when you have uh, uh, the support of the family. Next, please. Let me turn now to the state. When uh, we look at, for some, for some countries here, I just choose uh, three countries, and I look at the cost of aging as a percentage of GDP, the cost of aging for the state. So basically it means that if I take Germany in, the 19, in 2019, Germany devoted 1.6% of GDP to uh, long-term care. And uh, if you put uh, pensions, health, and long-term care together, it was 19.3%. Um, and you can see the same figures for Spain and France. When we look at, we try to forecast that. By forecasting, I mean, you, you take some uh, reasonable demographic and economic uh, uh, forecast, and then you take the unchanged policies. And you can see that uh, spending is going to increase by one, uh, from 1.6 for Germany to 1.9. Uh, I mean, the increase is not that big. It's a bit bigger for France. Uh, does that mean that we should not worry? We should be careful because that means uh, unchanged policy. And we know that uh, uh, the current uh, public support for long-term care is not uh, 
sufficient. So uh, it's very likely that if there is a demand for more coverage, uh, there will be a, a, a we, we, there will be a need for more spending. Next, please. So the question is, uh, why do we need uh, public intervention? Because after all, uh, I mean, I mean, we we always have to 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 raise the question: Why do we need uh, the government? Well, there are two reasons. One of them is uh, a redistributive reason, when individuals differ in wages, but also in uh, survival and dependence probabilities. Uh, it's very important to we we can expect that the government has to intervene. Uh, well, at one point, people thought that it would be enough, I mean, to have an optimal income tax uh, to do the business, but it, it can be shown that given precisely that we have uh, such an heterogeneity across individuals, it does not suffice and uh, a social insurance uh, is uh, socially desirable. One other reason is that uh, we have market and family failures. And so there are a number of, uh, of models which uh, look at uh, the optimal design of public policy for different settings as to the behavior of, market, of families in the market. Uh, in all these models, and I will not uh, be able to cover all these models, but uh, the basic uh, structure of these models is that you have a government which behaves as a Stackelberg leader, which takes into account the responses of both the market and the family. Next, please. And so I give you here a list of uh, eight uh, different models there are much more models than that, uh, which take into account certain type of feature uh, of either the family or the market. For example, we have the uncertain family aid, which means that uh, you cannot always be sure that uh, you will get some help from your kids. So it is a, a sort of uncertainty on uh, whether your kids will help you. Uh, the reasons why they would not help you, I mean, are numerous. I mean, it could be purely demographic or it can be economic. I mean, there are many reasons, but it's an uncertainty which uh, we cannot ignore. There is also the fact that uh, the market has a very high loading cost. Then there is the issue of strategic exchange. I mean, here we have a family in which uh, you have exchange uh, between the kids and the parents, exchange uh, which can be exchange of uh, money or exchange of uh, time, but uh, it, those exchanges can be uh, uh, purely uh, uh, non-strategic or strategic, but anyway, it, it's going to affect, I mean, the way uh, the public policy is going to be designed. When instead of uh, altruism, the family aid is uh, motivated by a norm, that's going to change also the nature of the optimal policy. The gender issue is quite important as well, because uh, uh, just to give you an example, uh, we know that uh, women help uh, uh, more than men, and also women live longer than men. So uh, that has to be taken into account when designing the policy. The opportunity cost of labor, the fact it's clear that uh, helping uh, parents uh, is uh, easier, or let's say more uh, attractive for people with low income, labor income, than for people with high income. And that also you can, uh, in, uh, in designing the, the optimal uh, long-term care policy, 
it's important to take that into account that the, the low income individuals, families are going to help in time and the high income people are going to uh, help their parents, dependent parents in cash. Variable altruism, I just mentioned that. Uh, and then we have uh, the fact that uh, the risk of dependence and the risk of survival are different uh, and they are not correlated with income in the same way. Next, please. So, I mean, a way of distinguishing the, the different models existing, the prevailing models, is to look at uh, the case where individuals are identical ex ante and the case where they are not the same. Uh, and I will give you just an example of uh, those models. So in the case of identical individuals, the choice between private and social insurance is going to depend on the respective loading cost or on the reimbursement rule. And it hinges also on the reactive behavior of the family. And for example, this is a type of model we, which, uh, which has been developed when family aid is uncertain and opting out is enforced. There are cases where the market cannot out, out best social insurance. Also, when the market reimbursement rule is limited, a social insurance with, with deductible can be shown to be uh, efficient in the line of uh, Arrow's theorem. Next, please. Now, turning to different individuals, social insurance aims at some redistribution, and its role will depend on the correlation between dependence risk and uh, income an income. And given that the correlation between dependence, risk, and income is uh, negative, whereas the correlation between survival probability and income is clearly negative, it can be shown that the case for a long-term care social insurance is strong, much stronger than that of public pensions. So these are just examples of the, the existing models. Next, please. A few words on the positive models, because uh, so far, I mean, I've looked at uh, a, a government which maximizes some sort of welfare function. Here, I mean, we look at uh, models where the long-term care would be uh, decided through a voting process. And there are two types, two interesting topics which have been analyzed. One of them deal with the reasons which explain why it might be uh, possible and even desirable to let part of the middle class to apply to LTC, to long-term care social assistance. So to a certain extent, uh, in a certain way, we can say it's bad. It's too bad that uh, the middle class is uh, using the resources which should be targeted to the poor. But at the same time, to let part of it, of the middle class, use those resources can be, uh, can be desirable from a political economy viewpoint, because that would mean that there would be enough uh, political support for a long-term care social insurance. The second type of model, it's uh, just to show that uh, the social long-term care insurance can be supported by majority voting, even when you have a private long-term care insurance. Next, and uh, finally, I mean, uh, I will stop here. I will say that uh, there is a clear need to build a bridge between those theoretical studies and the rich empirical work. Uh, 
the presentation I just made, which is very sketchy, I realized you can find it on a on a on a paper uh, by uh, with uh, Justina and uh, myself. That's all. Thanks. And uh, I don't know if we have time for question, Emmanuel. So thank you, Pierre. Um, do we have questions? Questions, comments? Yes. Philippe? Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I have two re, just two questions or remarks to Pierre. The, 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 the first one is uh, Pierre said uh, there is uh, uh, in the cash indemnity model of long term care, there is a problem of too long period of uh, long term care. But, but to my knowledge, it's not such a, pro a main problem. The duration of uh, the long-term care is not a big problem with uh, cash indemnity insurance. Uh, what is a problem with cash indemnity insurance is much more inflation. That is, most of the, 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 the insurance don't cover the risk of inflation. And what people cannot anticipate is exactly inflation. It's my first remark and question to Pierre. The second one uh, is, is the question of the public system. Pierre uh, just uh, uh, presented some arguments in defense of a, uh, a public system. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, with long-term care, the management of nursing home by the the public authorities is relatively difficult and all the more because the demand is very diverse. Uh, the, 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 the public uh, administration is good at, at uh, presenting one solution fits all, but it's not adapted for a diversified offer. And what we know from our experience is that for a uh, older person, uh, nursing home is relatively differentiated by families and they have very specific needs they want to provide to their elderly. And it, it, it is not exactly the same, whatever the level of income, uh, the demand is not homogeneous by level of income. It's, it's my, to remark and question, in fact. Yeah, thank you, Philippe. Uh, let me quickly answer those two questions. The first one, I agree with you. I mean, uh, uh, the, the lump sum type of uh, reimbursement, I mean, has no time limit. So, and the question, as I said, Earl, I, I think I wasn't very clear, but uh, I wanted to say for that kind of pool of reimbursement, the issue is that it's not big enough. Quite often it's uh, much below the uh, what it costs. So totally. Uh, concerning the, the other question, uh, it's an important question because it's true that in our theoretical model, we are uh, unfortunately very simplistic. Uh, and uh, for example, as I said earlier, I mean, there's a very important distinction between financing and provision. And I think basically we, we assume, we look at the, the financing issue more than the provision. And uh, I, there is very little work about the provision of uh, nursing homes and the nursing services. And uh, it's more for the uh, industrial organization people than for the public economists, but it's a big issue. Uh, and uh, we don't make the distinction. We, we should make it more often. Thank you. Uh, another question? I don't see everyone, so. Uh, I have a question, a quick question for you, uh, I would like to return to the intragenerational agency problem. So as I understand, maybe I'm wrong, uh, senior don't buy, uh, parents don't buy insurance because they anticipate family support, right? They don't want to buy insurance or because they, they anticipate that some, uh, the daughter or the family will support them. 
You mean the uh, the, the moral hazard issue? Yes, yes. And so is that bad? It, it, it is it is bad for for welfare. So uh, fa such family support, or uh, if that is bad, how do you fight against that agency problem? Can you force the senior well, the parents to to not <laughs> wait about the family help? Well, it's a tricky tricky issue. I mean. Uh, they, it's not the fact that they don't expect, they want to, in a certain way, to force their kids. Mm. Uh, the, the, the problem with, the, with uh, family help is that uh, uh, on, at first sight, it looks like a good thing, a sort of win-win uh, solution. Uh, kids are happy to help their parents, and parents are happy to, to be helped by their kids. But as I said, when you look at all the collateral effects, Uh, particularly in the case of severe uh, dependence, uh, I think it's we should be careful. I mean, uh, help uh, is not always a good thing because the 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 effect. I mean, uh, after the when when the parents passes away, mm -hmm. uh, the damages are huge, and you can see. I mean, the the amount of depression and all sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, But I think. Uh, I think also that the more tricky stuff is that when you are three, three brothers and sisters in the same family, which one is in charge of the parent? That, uh, oh, this uh, quite often one which is sacrificed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because but, it's but more that, more as out between uh, brother and sister than between parents. And, uh, and But that changed a lot across countries. I mean, thanks to SHARE, mm -hmm. which is a panel on uh, elderly people in Europe, Uh, we can see that uh, the role of the family and the, and the type of arrangement among kids uh, varies quite a lot uh, across countries. But that's another, another issue. Okay, so if we have uh, no more questions, I propose, so I would like to thank again uh, Pierre for this uh, nice overview, nice uh, general presentation. And the floor is the next, our next speaker will be Olga Strulik from Göttingen, who will speak about the optimal demand for medical and long-term care. And so before you start, uh, Olga, I have to apologize because I, I have to teach at uh, 3 a. Uh, yeah, at 3, yeah, at 3 or something. So uh, Emmanuel, can you share the session just after? Yes I, yes, I can. Thanks a lot. And then so, uh, I would like to inform you uh, of a change in the program. Mm -hmm. Mathieu Lefebvre and uh, Chiara Canta have switched uh, mm -hmm. their slot. Okay. So uh, Chiara fans uh, will therefore have to stay longer uh, mm -hmm. to, to hear uh, Chiara. But after, uh, just after the, the, the talk of uh, Olga, uh, Mathieu Lefebvre... Uh, Uh, it okay. is the Mathieu presentation. Okay, so thank you. So all your other floor is yours. Thanks a lot. All right. So thank you for inviting me and to uh, being interesting in uh, our work. Can I uh, uh, share my screen? Let me see. Can you see this? Yeah. Great. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes. Um, okay. So this is joint work with Johannes uh, Schönemann and Timo Trimborn, and um, it's about long-term care in this kind of continuous time life cycle uh, models we are usually working with. And I think I don't know uh, need so much of an motivation in this for this crowd and. Maybe also not an introduction after uh, we had the keynote lecture, but let me just emphasize one thing here with this picture, which shows um, health-related uh, expenditure by age uh, in the US. This is uh, also not our work, but from Dinadi and co-authors. Uh, but what we usually do in our models is kind of we fit here, this rising health expenditure uh, with age. Yeah, and then we 
make predictions with the models and policy conclusions and all kinds of stuff. And when we match this to the data, we are quite happy uh, and then we continue. But almost always it is overlooked that this are different, that the composition here of the expenditure and from a, a perspective of their function, they are very different because kind of the only the darker part here is kind of serious health expenditure in the sense of preventive and curative expenditure, treatment, if you wish. And the uh, light gray stuff is long-term care expenditure. And the kind of fascinating thing here is that all this increase with age of expenditure is driven by long-term care expenditure. And, and, and the other is basically flat after a certain age. And maybe it goes even down a bit. So, in, which means that if we lump this all together and then act as if all of this expenditure would, would be kind of the normal uh, expenditure uh, for treatment, there's a big, is, is a big mistake. And in, in this, in, in this uh, model I'm presenting, we kind of repair it. Uh, so we, we would like to take into account this different condition. Uh, so we have medical care expenditure to care or to prevent health deficits and long-term care expenditure to help for the daily routine, yeah, to uh, help with activities of uh, daily living, uh, instrumental ones for that being. So, uh, so it, it, they, these have totally different functions in the model and then also potentially for the predictions that you get out of it. And the, the, the main question is that, I mean, you can answer a lot of questions perhaps, but uh, for now, what we do with the model is how these, do these different forms of expenditure respond optimally to increasing income and better technology? And the idea is that we, an in, in individual in, in a younger generation yeah, faces the same constraints, but he probably has higher income and uh, uh, gets a better medical technology. And what does it do with this total expenditure and the composition of the expenditure? And this we think is interesting in its own right, but it is also kind of, there's an interesting ambiguity here because we actually, we don't know a priori, uh, what will happen with long-term care expenditure? Because we have two uh, effects that counteract each other. As the guy gets older, yeah, he lives a longer part at old ages where he is potentially dependent on long-term care, but he is also healthier. That's the main reason why he became so old. So at every age he is healthier and thus does, uh, is less likely yeah, to uh, need expensive uh, long-term care. In April, we don't know uh, what effect he dominates and by how much. And we try and answer with an economic life cycle model of aging. So where we, um, this is uh, not about uh, uh, general equilibrium in public policy, it's just one guy, an average uh, American later on, uh, and, and his decisions over the life cycle, where we distinguish between these two uh, forms of uh, 
health-related expenditure, in particular with respect to what happens with the composition and the absolute level of these expenditures. And as a sideline, this is also maybe interesting in, uh, as a contribution to the so-called red herring uh, uh, hypothesis. I don't know whether you heard of this, but uh, Seifel and his co-authors are kind of obsessed with this. Uh, and it's uh, and, 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 and emphasizes a lot that this whole idea that uh, health expenditure rises with age, and thus there will be more health expenditure as people get older, is all a hoax because it doesn't depend on age. It depends on nearness to death. And we think that with, with our model here, we can actually speak to this uh, uh, hypothesis and investigate whether and to which degree it holds true or not in our setting. So, but I also want to use this forum you know, and this opportunity to spread the gospel and make some advertisements for the health deficit model because that's uh, the general framework that we use. And this is intended to replace the Grossman model. And the Grossman model is this framework that was in use for 40 years or uh, 50 uh, um, uh, to address this kind of questions and which I think is wrong. So in the Grossman model, people, uh, accumulate uh, health capital, big age. Yeah? Uh, that's the change of he health capital over time. And that's a depreciation rate. And the assumption here is basically, if you look at it, that, or if you compare two people, the one with the greater age, with more human capital, the healthier guy loses more health capital gets less healthy sooner than the healthy guy. And that's simply wrong. If you ask uh, medical scientists or gerontologists or uh, other people outside economics, they say, no, this is not how it is. The opposite is true. So then we just start from the opposite and say, no, no, people do not accumulate health capital as they grow older, what they accumulate actually are health deficits. And the more health deficits you have, the faster is the speed at which you get new ones. And this is how gerontologists basically think life works. Yeah, uh, Pretty sad, but this is kind of consistent with observations. In the little age are then health expenditures, which, which you can slow down here, uh, the accumulation of health deficits, or here you can invest into your health capital. Another problem with the health capital is that nobody knows what it is. Yeah? Nobody, you cannot communicate with medical scientists or other people outside economics, but uh, also not with normal people. And after uh, tonight, I visit my old father. And when I, I ask him, what's your health capital? He would say, what? Huh? And have no clue. But when I ask him, what are your health deficits? He will list me and say, do you know that I'm suffering from this and this and that? And he knows his deficit, has deficits perfectly, as does his doctor. So we can have a, have a language uh, to understand each other. And how to measure health deficits? Well, there we rely also on gerontologists that suggest to measure it with the health deficit index. And this is just a relative number that counts the presence of health deficits in a person from a long list yeah, of this list of 30 or 40 health deficits, how many are present in the person? 
And then if you, if you look at this, we, uh, on average, the, these are very systematically accumulated as we get older in an exponential fashion. Actually, we get roughly three to 4% more health deficits from one birthday to the next. So it's a kind of an exponential or quasi exponential uh, accumulation of health deficits. And of course, there is a lot of individual, at the individual level, it is stochastic. Yeah, but if you look at the average guy, uh, it looks, uh, or representative individual, it looks deterministic. So here we kind of use these ideas in such a health deficit model and uh, implement uh, personal care uh, uh, expenditure and then calibrate it also using insights from these authors and our own empirical studies and uh, fit the model to the data and then kind of use it for counterfactual experiments. And in particular for today uh, on the effect of income and technology on uh, long-term care expenditure. That's basically the idea. So the, how does this work? So I, I, I happily uh, noticed in the introduction that there are also mathematicians in the audience. So I don't want to bore you with formula, but okay. at least I know that there is no problem to get Can understood. Can I ask something? Uh, yes, Matthias, go. If, if it's urgent, yes. Uh, yes, or should I defer? It's just because it's about the, the deficit versus health uh, versus capital distinction. Or should I postpone to the end? I'm perhaps I don't know whether I, okay. I yes. But if it's if it's necessary to follow, I'm not it's against not necessary asking to follow, no. question okay. uh, during the talk. Hmm? Okay. So th this is just experienced utility from consumption, which is then but only uh, experienced uh, at a given age when the guy survives. And uh, survival depends on this health deficit, you know, the frailty index. And then this is all discounted to the present. And at big T, uh, uh, life is uh, over for sure, uh, but this is endogenous. Yeah? So survival and lifespan are endogenous and depend on health deficits. And then we have a normal kind of instantaneous utility function uh, that uh, people maximize. And then here you see this kind of, if you ignore the last two terms, you have this exponential uh, accumulation of health deficits over life, kind of with this new as kind of natural yeah, aging. But then with health expenditure, you can reduce it. And with decreasing returns to uh, uh, expenditure, uh, measured by gamma. And this A, this will also be one of our parameters for our experiments, is this level of medical technology, how, it, how efficient it is to reduce health deficits. Uh, 200 years ago, this was probably uh, close to zero. All right, and then, but then there's also long-term care expenditure. And so this, and the idea is, so you see, when you do medical expenditure, yeah, health deficit accumulation is reduced, survival is uh, uh, higher, and life expectancy uh, greater. But long-term care expenditure has a totally different purpose. It doesn't increase life expenditure or survival. It is just uh, essential for activities of daily living. But when you have more health deficits, you increase the probability that you need long-term care. That's the P. And you increase the level uh, uh, of long-term care, or, or yes, or the magnitude of long-term care expenditure. And, and, but this is not at all kind of instrumental for being healthier. Uh, that's just of uh, getting a, only for getting a, a, around. 
And then there's this budget constraint where people get a, a wage income and later pension, capital income, here only from annuities for simplicity. They spend on consumption, on medical expenditure, and then long-term care. And these are the two prices, P and Q, of these activities. And then the, the, the individual has this problem to maximize an expected lifetime utility subject to these two dynamic constraints, the costs of long-term care and initial conditions, uh, the initial health and final health and initial uh, 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 wealth and final wealth. So this is a, a free terminal time uh, uh, problem and uh, uh, which in, in the problem of optimal control can be solved with standard methods. And then from the first order conditions, you get it. I guess everybody in the audience knows this Euler equation or Ramsey equation for consumption growth, right? That also comes out of this life cycle model that says how, how, how does the individual want to allocate consumption expenditure over time? So nothing new here, but then we have also health expenditure, an Euler health equation, if you wish, uh, which gives you the growth rate of health expenditure. And if you just ignore this big last time for a moment, you see that it depends on the difference between the interest rate and the natural aging rate. And if the interest rate is larger than the natural aging rate, it makes sense to have health expenditure later in life. It's a, 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 rational, a, 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 a very simple uh, rational for an ex, ex, increasing health expenditure path. But then we have this long term that doesn't appear in the kind of normal health deficit model, which is all driven by a long term care. And if you look, uh, this is the, this this uh, effect in in parentheses is is, is positive, right? because this is how the probability of receiving long term care goes up when you health deficits increase, and how the level of expenditure increases when health deficits increase, and how survival declines as health expenditure increases. So this is all positive, uh, but the uh, multiplier uh, in front is negative because that's the shadow price of health deficits. And since health deficits are bad, by design, they contribute negatively to the objective function. So this is negative and reduces the slope, but we don't know yet by much, by how much. But if you, if you come back to the initial thing, yeah, and we want to know why is this no longer increasing? Yeah, so maybe then the intuition is here. Yeah? It is reduced because of uh, the last term here, because health long-term care kind of becomes more important uh, 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 as individuals are older and thus they shift more of their kind of other health expenditure to younger ages. And thus the slope of this expenditure gets flatter. That's the idea here. Okay, and then we calibrate the model uh, with, uh, uh, with a, it's the survival function, a, a probability for ex, uh, a long-term care and level. And uh, th these are all dependent on health deficits, not on chronological age. And then we fit so, but how do the functions look like, yeah, the, the parameters? Well, to get the parameters, we know how deficits evolve with age from the papers from Mitnitsky, uh, we take this uh, past, and then we determine the slope of the function and its location such that when we fit in deficits by age into a deficits by survival, we get survival by age, and that's the normal survival function, which we then compare with data from mortality org or whatnot. Uh, and the dots are the data points. Huh? So this is kind of this uh, 
familiar survival uh, by age function, but survival doesn't depend on age, right? It depends on, this is already here an outcome. It's an, it's, survival depends on health deficits. And similarly for uh, the probability to receive long-term care, we fit in health deficits into this unknown association between long-term care probability and health deficits, and then get a prediction how long-term care probability uh, uh, is associated with age, which we then can again confront with the data. So this is our data for an average US American uh, uh, who is uh, 20 in the year 2012. And then we uh, calibrate all the other parameters uh, or, sorry, then we have all the other parameters and some of them we just set and the others we uh, jointly estimate to uh, with some targets. One is to get the life expectancy of this guy right, then to get match, uh, medical expenditure at four different ages, long-term care expenditure at two ages and a maximum lifespan. So here are the, the uh, externally set parameters. You see the, these first five, we already, I already showed you how th they were obtained uh, from, from this functions uh, here. So these are already from there. And we have initial deficits, the decreasing returns of health expenditure, the wage of the guy, the uh, interest rate, with this are prices are all normalized and um, uh, the replacement uh, 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 rate uh, for, uh, um, for, for, for pensions. And, um, and then these are all the unknown parameters, which are then uh, estimated. And some of them are just latent and we don't know what, what to make out, out of them. But for example, this mu, this natural rate of aging, that's actually measurable in the, in the data. And this is what we, uh, 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 it, is, it fits very well to what Mitnitsky and co-authors have uh, measured uh, for, in this case, Canadian men and women. That's the uh, intertemporal elasticity of substitution, which is close to one, which is also kind of assuring. And then this is the prediction here. So this is medical care increasing with age, but then flattening at the latter ages. The dots are again the data. And this is uh, 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 per user, long-term care, uh, but not everybody needs uh, long-term care. So this is then the, the time pass of per capita long-term care, which increases uh, much more steeply. Yeah, and corresponds to the graph from the introduction. And here are the health deficits that uh, the guy develops as he ages. So now to the, that's the model. Now to the experiment. What happens if uh, medical technology and income improve? Let's first consider medical technology. So the idea here is that we increase the A, and to just to figure out by how much we say, by how much would A increase if the medical technology increases by 1% per year? From empirical exercises, we have a, this prior that this is a good estimate for medical technological progress. So here's the answer. So the blue lines are the same as before and the red dashed lines are now uh, the, the response uh, to this improved medical technology, uh, more health expenditure, and thus uh, the, at any age, there's the probability to uh, uh, depend on long-term care declines. The, thus, uh, uh, also the per you, or, or because people are generally healthier at any age, also the long-term care expenditure declines at any age, and thus, as a, as a, as a combined uh, combination of the two, 
uh, per capita health expenditure declines as well, even stronger. But that's not kind of relevant for the individual because the individual looks at expected long-term care expenditure. Yeah? So, and this is perhaps the most interesting figure here in the lower left uh, panel, which is invertedly U-shaped. So if it is first increasing because uh, um, it, uh, it is more uh, likely to get uh, receive long-term care as the guy gets older, but then it is declining become, because it, it becomes less and less likely to survive to these old ages in which eventually becomes the dominating effort. And then you see if, if the uh, red curve would be uh, would perfectly overlap with the blue curve, then we would find support for this red herring hypothesis. Then it would be just uh, uh, irrelevant uh, for, uh, uh, for, 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 for uh, long-term care e expenditure, how, how long the guy lives, but um, uh, it isn't. Uh, so th this shifts upwards. So, but maybe not, not so much as expected. And then that's the final experiment here. So look at the, at the, at the uh, uh, absolute numbers, uh, what, the numbers behind the figure. Uh, so this is this increase of medical technology by 10 per, uh, 1% per year. Then expected long-term care increases by roughly 4% compared to our benchmark calibrated individual, but medical expenditure increases by much more. So that's kind of the takeaway here. So that the share of long-term care expenditure or the ratio between long-term care expenditure and medical expenditure actually declines quite heavily. Life expectancy increases naturally and the last here is the elasticity. Yeah? By how much increase, uh, how, by how much increases long-term care expenditure when life expectancy increases by 1%. And I don't have time to go over all the other experiments. Here we have other technology improvements. Here we have income. Uh, and the numbers are uh, uh, slightly different. Yeah? Of, and of course, it, it, it matters how great the change is, but look at this elasticity here. It's basically always the same, right? 1.7. And you can, and, but this, and then we, you could say, yeah, this is expected expenditure, but relevant for life cycle decisions, is the discounted expected expenditure uh, that, the, that the guy faces now when he is 20 and makes his life cycle planning. And this is lower, this is around 1%. And this is kind of the uh, uh, rule of thumb. 1% one, uh, one percent, uh, more long-term care expenditure for every uh, uh, percentage increase in life expectancy that the model predicts. There's a problem with the model because empirically, uh, as you probably know, life ex uh, long term care expenditure increases much more heavily. Empirically, it increases roughly in sync uh, with other health care expenditure. Whereas our model predicts that the ratio should actually decline when this guy makes optimal decisions. So that's kind of interesting food for thought, I would say, because uh, uh, if it is actually much more uh, steeply increasing, that must be for reasons outside the model. Pretty likely compositional effects, uh, through demographic change, 
but also maybe some of the uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, Pierre uh, emphasized in his uh, uh, talk. Uh, but I think I'm already a bit over time, and uh, that's it for now. Thank thanks, you. Thanks a lot, uh, Olga, for this uh, very nice uh, talk. Question? Comments? Yeah. Can yes. I ask? Yes, you can. Yeah. For the cheese. Uh, Olga, I, I am a bit puzzled by the first uh, graph that you show. I mean, when you start. This one? Yeah, because. I mean, I was always, first, I mean, I'm puzzled by the fact that you take uh, the age and in 100, uh, are you talking about the average individual? Because we know that uh, uh, that's part of the big puzzle. We know that uh, most healthcare occurs two years before death. And given yes. that uh, we have individuals who die at different ages, uh, we should not have that the, the, the curve you have there. I mean, we should have uh, health uh, spending going up quickly before death. But here we don't know at what time we are dying because you give us an average. Yes. So in fact, you are, the, it's not very clear the issue you are dealing with. Yes. Because, uh, I, I yeah I, I I agree but this is this uh, this is kind of not our figure yeah so this is from Dinardi French and other uh, famous American economists and they this is kind of standard right to to look at at the data to look at expenditure by age and not at expenditure uh, by distance to death. Yeah. And that's also kind of the argument of uh, the red herring hypothesis that for expenditure, it should ma matter how, how close you are to, uh, to, to, to death and not how old you are. And in principle, we, we see this here, right? Uh, because uh, um, so, the, so the, the, the red guy here, right? So yeah. the, if you get, in this experiment, you get 2.3% more life expectancy since the guy is roughly mm -hmm. 80 on average, you get two more years. Huh? Um, but uh, um, but uh, the, um, but the curve, so, the, and we have two, two movements. Yeah? The curve shifts out. Yeah? Uh, just you, you have to basically, you can interpret as, as, as the, that you have the same expenditure two years later, or as I did during the talk, when you are at this age, the probability that you have the expenditure declined. So, in this kind of figures, we take this in, into account, huh? but I completely agree with you that in the introductory figure, it kind of can be misleading, but that's the way how stuff is presented usually. Okay. Thanks, Matthias and after Grigori. First Matthias question. Yeah, I, I had two questions. Yeah, maybe I asked the more, the more important one. So the, uh, so I didn't see, aren't you implicitly assuming a value of being alive? So I didn't, uh, with the CS no. functional, I think you were using for utility. Um, uh, no, no. You have negative values or if you have values beyond one, right? You always get that effect that people may want to actually die yes. and shorten their lives. Yes. Uh, so can, did you, did I miss something here? Do you put something in the utility or? No, no, here, here we don't need it. Because uh, uh, the, 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 uh, this is always positive. Huh? So you're not using CS. You're not using power utility. Uh, oh, we do, we do, but uh, never. The, so, but this guy gets only. Uh, uh, so, so, where do we have the utility function? But I mean, there for the yeah. beyond one, right? In the empirical range, right? You have a negative sign, right? For sigma greater one. No. So there. No, I, I, oh, I, I subtract one here. 
Okay, but then it still depends on the scale, right? Yes, yes. Where but the scale is high the enough. Yeah. So you... yeah. The scale That's is high right. enough. But I mean, to get rid of it, I mean, the, the Hall and Jones, for example, just add a number here. Huh? Exactly. And that, this could be something that, uh, that you, uh, that you, which is hard to explain, but would be the, the value to be alive, as you said. Yeah, yeah. We'll we we, we could add it experiment. and then set it to zero at, uh, in our calibration. That's perhaps bet, a better intuition, right? I could add here a constant. And then when I calibrate the model, I see, aha, it, we don't need it. It can be zero. But it drives people's choices, right? That's my point. So No, here, um, but I since we don't have it, yeah, it, 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 is, it drives not people's choices. Uh, I would say, yeah, okay, but... But yeah, maybe, maybe, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm one of the co-authors. Um, maybe I can add something here. Um, it is actually, we, we, if we would do the same as in Holland Jones and would like to fit the value of life, right? The monetary mm -hmm. value of life, we would actually come as Holger said to the conclusion that this is zero, right? Because the, the lifetime utility as we presented here without the constant already delivers the value of life that we find empirically. And the utility function here is, is never below zero. Because oh, great. But if you, if you check that, then that's, that's fine, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Yeah. good. But I think you, one has to be aware of the, yeah, that yeah. one is making the assumption here. Okay. So the value of life of this guy, of the calibrated individual, is uh, 9 million, which I think is uh, quite, quite, quite mm -hmm. well with the kind of statistical value of life. Okay, Grigory, last question. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Olga. I was quite convinced by your defense of uh, health deficit models. So thanks a lot for, for your talk. I had a, a question about the modeling of time. Uh, in the model, when there is a health deficit, it pushes the survival probability down. So it makes people impatient uh, more rapidly. Uh, and I see that the model delivers very nice results in terms of calibration. But my question was, what about the results we could get if we were assuming a kind of less uh, straightforward updating of the survival probability. I'm not sure that the person who has deficit necessarily becomes more impatient. Uh, I mean, it's something else uh, in a way we could say. In the model, it is conflated with the biological discount factor. So I was wondering whether you were considering also other calibrations with a uh, less automatic updating of the survival function, but you already have nice results without that. So it's not no, I mean, this is a, it's, it's, I, I know you, Gregory, you are a very clever guy. And I think there's also a clever comment. And I think, uh, so actually I thought about this uh, also, but never did it uh, so far. The idea is, so, I mean, in reality, uh, I, I strongly believe, right, that survival probability depends on the health deficits that the guy ha has. But when he makes his life cycle plans, he could choose something else. Could depend, for example, he could think that it depends on chronological age or make some other mistakes. Uh, uh, so, and I think this is actually a relevant issue yeah, to say that, that people make actually don't, uh, are not able to assess this probability correctly and then implement it in their life cycle decisions. And then kind of their life cycle plans are made on the wrong uh, facts. And then, uh, uh, and then it's interesting what happens then, but I, I, and I know a, a paper that discusses this in a totally different context, but I never tried it out here. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, now, uh, Mathieu, the floor is yours. Thanks okay, a lot, so Olger. I need Olger to, uh, to finish to share the screen in order for me to share mine. Uh, okay, where it is. Okay, is it okay? Can you see my slides? 
yes it's okay okay um, so uh, thank you for uh, for for the invitation to present uh, this work today so uh, this is a, a joint work with um, with Xavier Sergio Pierre and and uh, and Jerome who are all in uh, and at the University of Liège and I think they all are also uh, present uh, today so if any questions I cannot answer to uh, they could maybe help me so the the, the paper deal with the uh, with the, the nursing homes and the mortality in the in the nursing homes um, the, the starting point of our um, studies here has been this uh, recent debate that we uh, have had about the uh, um, the um, the um, they said the, the number of deaths that we observe uh, COVID-19 pandemic in uh, in the nursing homes. Um, the uh, if, if we look at some of the numbers um, um, about um, the, the COVID-related deaths in a few European countries, uh, there are some figures that show that about, for example, in Spain, 66% of the total COVID-related deaths was actually uh, from uh, nursing home residents. And these kind of numbers also are found in, uh, in France and in Germany with 50% or 35%. And uh, related these um, um, COVID-related deaths in nursing homes, um, there, there was quite a, a large discussion in the public debate and in the, in the news, of course, about the, the possible, of course, low quality of care um, that could explain that these um, uh, elderly actually died quite a lot in the nursing homes. What is also interesting in these numbers is the kind of disparities that we observe among these European countries um, in terms of these number of deaths of the, the percentage, uh, uh, the mortality rate, I would say, that we observe in nursing homes, we saw quite differences uh, between European countries that questions actually the, the quality and maybe the institutional features of these nursing homes in Europe. And as, as Pierre mentioned uh, it in, uh, in his presentation, the very recent uh, OPIA scandal, uh, that, that means if you do not know that, uh, we have some, um, some journalists from the Journal Le Monde in France that this week released a book um, about um, these OPR uh, nursing homes uh, that actually cast some doubt actually about the, the care in, in, in the nursing homes. And of course, these uh, possible uh, higher mortality or lower health status of the nursing home residents uh, could be a problem actually uh, if these uh, mortality is due to the to the own characteristics of these nursing homes. I mean, uh, if the cause actually is the structure or the organization of the nursing home, that means that we should maybe do something in terms of public policy. Uh, these numbers about the, the deaths uh, in nursing homes is also important regarding the, the long-term care policy. That means all the discussions that we could have about how we should organize long-term care, how we should deliver it, and of course, how we could finance it at the end. And, and, and also the question is all about um, this, the role and, and the substitution possible between the, 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 the informal care and the formal care. Okay, um, so um, the, the, this is where uh, our 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 study takes place because when we when we look at the literature about the nursing home, we have two strands of the literature. One that is being um, dedicated to the to the choice of housing at at old age. We have some quite many studies that have tried to to um, to uh, to estimate what are the drivers, the determinants of the elderly um, choosing to go or not into a nursing homes, and usually what they point. Uh, compared to the prices, of course, it's also um, the role of these activities of daily um, living uh, um, limitation, um, the assets or the income of these elderly, the, the partnership, meaning uh, do, do they have some, uh, some partners or not that could take care of them if they have some limitation, but also they, also, they, they often point out uh, the quality as determinants of a choice uh, of a nursing homes. By quality, I mean quality of the nursing homes as measured by some um, uh, resources aspect. And, and regarding this, uh, this quality, um, there are also some studies that have tried to identify uh, possible factors of mortality within the nursing homes. We, we cite a few uh, ones in, in the slides. And, what they show, um, uh, these kind of study, it, it's of course the role of comorbidity and limitation, but also the quality of the nursing homes. The big problems we, uh, we have found in this literature is that often these studies are, um, are let's say, affected by endogeneity issues, and so that we, we lack of causal evidence. And this is where basically our paper takes place, actually. Our studies, uh, we try actually um, using data from the, the survey on health, aging, and retirement in Europe to estimate if being in a nursing home um, leads to higher mortality. Um, this is obviously done with some data that I'm going to present you 
that took place before the COVID-19 pandemic. And in order to try to conclude, and uh, I will try to convince you that we conclude on some causal evidence, we use a propensity score matching method to compare in the terminology of this method, some treated individuals who are actually um, elderly living in a nursing home to some untreated individuals who are living at home. And what we observe is that um, uh, after controlling for the determinants of entry uh, uh, into a, a nursing home, uh, the difference in mortality can be attributed somehow to the way these nursing homes are designed and organized or saying different to the quality of head and service that we could find at home compared to, uh, to the nursing homes. And um, Harbour results, uh, just anticipating a bit our results, what we, what we find um, it's that there is an overall in our sample of European uh, data, uh, negative impact of being in a nursing homes on life expectancy. But, but this overall impact is actually um, driven by some differences among countries. And especially we find that in central and eastern countries of our sample, we have this significant uh, negative effect of being in nursing home on mortality, which is not the case in northern and southern country. Um, finally, looking at these uh, results, we tried to identify actual differences in terms of the quality of this uh, care facility and, uh, and, and to see if we can explain these results by some mechanism uh, that we find in the data. Let me just say, because I'm not sure that I will have much time to present it, that we also try to um, basically um, uh, go a bit further uh, in terms of sensitivity analysis, and our results are quite robust to some violation of the conditional independence assumptions. I will be back to this in a minute. Okay. So uh, let me maybe uh, first start by introducing uh, the data and, some, and giving you some descriptive uh, statistics about the, the questions we are interested in. So we, we use data from SHARE. Um, we use four ways from this survey, the waves, the waves four to seven. Uh, why so? Uh, we start from wave four because this is uh, when the survey starts to include nursing home residents, okay? And we uh, concentrate, we focus on a sample of individuals uh, age 65 plus that have have at least one um, limitation in the activity um, uh, of daily living. That means that we concentrate on some individuals that actually have already some limitation could lead them to go uh, within the nursing homes. We keep uh, the people for whom basically we can observe the, the, the place of residence and a time T, which is a wave, and, uh, and we can observe for them their status meaning being alive or that, uh, the next wave, so in T plus one. That means that we have eliminated some observation for which we do not have, of course, uh, these comparisons possible. We've also eliminated countries for which there were too few observation uh, in the sample uh, regarding the, the, the nursing home residency. But overall, our study is based on about uh, 30,000 observations for 13 countries, which is um, quite a thing. Um, a nice, a nice sample. Uh, if you want to, to, to know a bit more about that, I could show you um, the detail of the sample. And so what we have, what, what is the dependent variable we are really interested in, basically, it's to look at the mortality between two waves. That means that we observe the status of residents in one wave, and we look if this individual is still alive in the next wave. That means that we compare the mortality between wave four to five, five to six, and six to seven. For the analysis I'm going to present, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to present here, we have pulled all these transitions together to get a, a nice sample of transitions. Of course. Um, so ju just to show you a bit what we observe in our data. So here you have a, the, the table that show you uh, for the 13 countries uh, in our sample, and you can see that we have organized the sample such as basically identifying what we could call the northern country, the central country, the southern country, and the east tree from the sample, okay? And we have the mortality rates according to our transition between one wave to, to another, uh, according to the full sample, and then differentiating, uh, differentiating excuse me, according to the, uh, to the residency, basically. What is interesting, first of all, of course, is that we observe quite heterogeneity in terms of mortality rate in in our sample, uh, according to the, to the countries. Um, but also these differences uh, are quite interesting when we look at the difference between being in a nursing home or not, uh, actually, because we can observe that in almost all countries of the sample, there is a, an excess mortality um, of those in nursing homes compared to those who are 
at home. Uh, we, the, the, this last column shows us this mortality ratio, which is the, the ratio between the two mortality rates, which is bigger than one for most countries except for Italy, but I can go back to this um, later on to, to explain maybe the reason for that. Of course, looking at that is interesting. You could say, oh, it seems that the people in nursing homes die earlier than those who are still at home. But of course, we, the population within these two type uh, of, um, of, uh, of residencies can be totally different. That means that the, the people in nursing homes may differ from the people staying at home in terms of health, of course, but also age, marital status, wealth, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where we try to, uh, to, um, to introduce our propensity score matching method because we need to control for the possible simultaneous determination of health and housing, of course. And uh, this is true because still looking at our data, our uh, 13,000 observation, we can actually observe that when we look at some important statistic, descriptive statistics. If we compare these in you know, nursing homes to those who are still home, we observe that uh, actually um, the in terms of age, uh, the population is different. That means that those who are in the nursing homes are older than those who are at home on average. We observe also that those who are in nursing homes are mostly singles. We observe also that those who are nursing homes in our sample are more of the time coming from the first tercile of, of wells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that the, the two samples are quite different, actually, the, the subsamples. And this is why uh, we try to, to, um, to uh, introduce this propensity score uh, matching method in order to control uh, for the possible selection bias uh, that would be due to observables, the, these kind of different statistics and characteristics that we observe between the two. Uh, the two, um, the two sample, the two group, let's say like that, of our sample, okay? And so what we, uh, what we do, what I'm gonna present to you now is that we use this propensity score matching methods uh, in which we're gonna consider uh, those who are in a nursing home as being the treatment group. So uh, according to the common terminology of this, uh, of this method, uh, to those who are at home, which, will basically constitute our control group, okay? And what, what we try to do with this is to match uh, every individual that we observe in a nursing home, okay? Two individuals living at home who actually has the same or observable characteristics. And uh, doing this, it allows us to uh, um, condition we think on sufficient observable information to obtain a kind of counterfactual that we do not have by looking uh, simply at uh, the difference between these two groups, okay? And then um, that means that the, the difference in outcome that we could observe, the difference in terms of mortality rate that we could observe between uh, the, uh, I would say within this match pair can then be attributed to the treatment that means being in a nursing home. So that's the, the very uh, um, important hypothesis that we are doing to, to, to do this estimation, which is the, the, the conditional independence assumption. We assume that controlling of this uh, uh, on a set of observable characteristics, the mortality of the individuals in the control group and in the treated groups are independent of the residence status once actually we, we then have control for that. Okay. And um, in order to, uh, to do this estimation, so we, we, we use, of course, the uh, the density score matching. Uh, if you know a bit about this matching method, we are not going to uh, to match individuals according to all the sets of observables that seems important to explain the, the, the choice of being in nursing homes or not, but we use a propensity score that we obtain through a probability regression in which we try to estimate the probability to go into a nursing homes according to some important variables that explain that the two groups are a bit different, and, and these uh, balancing variables that we use in the analysis are here. We use of wave to control for the fact that we have different waves in our sample, but also gender, age, the partnership status, the wealth, the number of the limitation, the fact of having at least one child uh, or not, and the fact of suffering for at least two chronic diseases. So that means we have tried to introduce most of these important determinants that have been uh, pointed out in the literature that I was uh, cited before about the, um, the determinants of going into a, into a nursing home or so into a nursing home or not, okay? Um, 
So that's that's the that's the um, the, the methods and the, how we uh, implement it basically. Okay. Um, let me say uh, two last things about it before presenting you the results. Um, according to this propensity score matching method, we do it for the whole sample with the 13 countries. We do it also for each country separately. That means it's going to be also interesting in terms of results. Uh, we, we separate each country and we do the analysis within each country in order also to look at some differences in terms of the effect uh, uh, these two countries. Uh, what we have uh, done with this propensity score matching methods, of course, it's to be sure that the estimation achieved the right balance on covariate between the treated and, and the controls uh, units. And st starting from that, we have matched all observation according to a kernel matching algorithms. If you know a bit about propensity score matching method, we need to, to match these uh, the individuals from the two groups according to different algorithm. We use in the main analysis, uh, the kernel matching methods, but let me tell you that if you are interested in it, the, the, our results are really robust to uses to, to using other uh, matching algorithm like the, the nearest neighbor matching method without replacement and the radius and stratification matching methods with a replacement. And, and we, we, we here we use the kernel matching methods, okay? So uh, maybe let me show you uh, the result because I think this is really interesting here. Uh, so what we have here is the average treatment effect of the treated on the treated. So that means this is basically what is the, the effect of the nursing home uh, on mortality after controlling uh, for all these important determinants of being in nursing homes. And what you see is that for the overall uh, sample of analysis that we have, uh, we have a positive and very significant results at 1% here uh, that basically show us that uh, being in a nursing home increased by 10 percentage points, basically, uh, the probability uh, of, of dying, so the mortality rate, which is not that low because uh, the, in the whole sample, we observe about 20% of mortality uh, in our sample of data, uh, considering the, con taking into account all the individuals, which would correspond basically to 50% increase of the mortality rate, which is quite a lot. Uh, what is interesting also is when we look at our um, estimation by country uh, separately, because if you see there are types of country that popped up in our results. The first one, it seems that in the central uh, countries, and especially in Germany, uh, in, in France, Belgium, and uh, Luxembourg, Switzerland, we observe this significant positive effect. We find it also in the two Eastern countries um, in our, of our data. We do not find the same kind of positive um, and significant effect when we look at no other country and southern country, which just start to, um, uh, to question a bit, uh, maybe the, what, what I was saying in our introduction, maybe that those countries in the way they organize um, uh, their, um, their uh, nursing homes, the long-term care policy related regarding the, the, the use of nursing homes by, by residents and the quality of these nursing, home, the, these nursing homes are actually different. And this could actually explain that we observe the, 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 the diverging results, okay? I will go back to that at the very end of the presentation. I just want to go maybe, because I see that uh, the time is running, a bit quickly uh, on, a, on a second aspect, it's that you, you maybe tell us, yes, of course, but I'm not sure this conditional independent assumption, which is central to our analysis, the fact that we assume that after having control for the observable to which we have accessed, access, we, we, the mortality between the two groups can, uh, can be independent of these resident status. Um, and, and it's true that we can question it. So in order to go one step further, um, um, we, we implement um, a simulation strategy uh, in order to, to see how how results are actually robust to some deviation from this uh, CIA, this conditional independent assumption. Um, what, what we do, it's following uh, um, the strategy that has been developed by Ichino et al. in, uh, in, in their uh, Journal of Labor Economics 2008 paper. We assume uh, that this conditional independent assumption is not satisfied given the observable we have access, but would be if we could observe an observable, of course, uh, binary viable, uh, an additional binary viable, there would be such that um, we could simulate this, this potential co-founders 
adding them, adding it, sorry, to the covariate, and then comparing the results obtained with and without it. That means that by comparing these two, we can see to what extent our baseline results, the results that I just presented you, um, uh, would be robust to some failure of the CIA. So without maybe spending too much time on that, um, uh, the assumption that uh, we do here is that the CIA um, only holds given our set of observable X and this unobserved binary viable U. And the, the whole question here is that uh, this U um, should then be searched to impact the treatment and the outcome. What could be this unobserved viable? For example, in our controls, we do not have access to uh, um, the, uh, the informal care. And maybe that receiving some numbers of hours of informal care would affect the probability to go uh, within a nursing home, but would also affect the health status of the residents. So we, we could try to simulate um, how this additional uh, unobserved variable could affect uh, the result, and especially looking at how uh, it affects the probability of mortality, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the, 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 what we call the outcome effect here, and also the probability of going to the nursing home, which would be the selection effect, okay? So, uh, the whole questions now, to, just to finish, and I presented you the sensitivity analysis. The whole question is how we can simulate this unobserved uh, uh, variable that would be one of the covariates. As Ichino and Al propose, there are two ways, two, two approaches to do that. One would be to pick uh, the parameters of the distribution of these unobserved variables similar to the one we observe in the empirical distribution of the important binary covariates that we still introduce in our, in our analysis. The second approach would be to choose um, the, the, the parameters of the distribution of this binary variable as such that it kills, literally, the average treatment effect that we observe. That means that we, it would drive the, the ATT uh, to zero, okay? And still, if we can do that, we can compare the results. And if those results are very unlikely, that means that the exercise with, that we are doing here supports support the robustness of the estimates, okay? So just quickly, uh, the results, what I can tell you, first of all, if we try to do what we call what we call the confounder-like simulation, that means if we try to simulate this unobserved variable as the distribution we observe for being a woman or having at least one child or having at least two chronic disease or having a living partner, we'll still, we still find ATT that are really similar to what we observe in our main analysis. So that means adding these unobserved variable doesn't kill our results. We can, based on that, measure outcome effect and selection, selection effect that are a bit different to what we, they are a bit different according to the kind of, of distribution we, we have, but nothing really much um, um, uh, thrilling, I would say. Huh? Uh, if it's lower than one, it means that it decreases the probability of uh, of uh, higher mort of, of mortality. If it's uh, bigger than one here, it increases the probability that you go within a nursing home. You just say that. Now, the second exercise, it's with the killer confounder. So here we have show you four examples. Do not pay attention because I do not have much time to the to this DNS uh, parameters. But basically, what we do is we try to kill the ATT. So you see the ATT is going towards zero. And when we are able to have one unobserved variable that is such that it will basically pull our result towards zero, the selection effect and the outcome effect that we have are so high compared to what we observe above that are very unlikely. Because that means that it would affect the probability of going into a nursing home almost uh, 60 times more than what we observe with a simple simulation. Still the same with this outcome effect. You see it with double or, or, or three times higher. Than what we observe. So that means that they are very unlikely so that we can trust our, I would say, that our main results are uh, robust to uh, any violation of the, uh, of the CIA, okay? Now, the last things, uh, just to, uh, to finish my, my, my presentation, because I think this is probably one of the important results so far of, uh, of this paper. How can we explain these cross-country differences that we observe in mortality between uh, the countries? Um, you could say maybe that the population who are in uh, nursing homes in uh, 
um, in, in Germany or in France are totally different than the same population in Italy um, and, um, and Spain. You could say that there are different systems of health, which would be important to explain this diverging mortality. But we control for the health status. We control for the chronic disease. We control for the limitations in our analysis. So what's left? Maybe that are, this is the, uh, the assumption we are making in this paper, maybe that there are differences in terms of long-term care between this country that can explain it. In our analysis, we do not have micro day on care in the nursing home for the residents that we observe in, in, in the share. But if we try to relate, of course, our results to some figures, some macroeconomic figures, I would say, about the formal and informal long-term care, uh, it shows quite interesting evidence. So as I say it, we do that being careful about issues of reverse causation and just without concluding on any causal effect. We just try to identify some mechanism that should be, of course, investigated um, uh, in the future to, to relate uh, um, uh, the, uh, the long-term care policies in this country to the results we have in our analysis. And what we observe in the is quite a huge table. It's some interesting things. First of all, it seems that in the countries in which we observe significant, significant effect of being a nursing home on mortality, there is quite of a mix of lower spending, public spending, in terms of percentage of GDP uh, in long-term care. Also, a quite low number of long-term care a worker per, for, for 100 individuals age 65 plus, and also a quite high share of for-profit uh, nursing home compared to these other countries. That means that if you look at these continental and, and, um, and Eastern countries, uh, we can see here that the share of private or health care, home care is quite high uh, compared to the Nordic country, for example. We see also that regarding the, um, the, 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 the spending, the Nordic countries have, have quite a high uh, spending uh, in terms of percentage of GDP to, for, for the nursing home. And also looking at the informal care um, um, here, we observe two things that are interesting. In the southern country, they have a really high share of informal carer that, who provides at least 20 hours per week to the elderly. In the northern country, they have a very high share of population providing informal care, even if they do not provide that many hours compared to the southern country. But it means that it seems that the way the, the informal care is organized here is more like, a, 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 I would say, a mix of public and informal care. And here in the southern country, a quite high share of informal care, while it's not the case in our central and, uh, um, and, and southern countries. Okay, So these, these kind of results were totally descriptive, of course. Uh, Firstly, give us a kind of insight of what we could um, look for or what we should investigate a bit more in order to understand um, the, how we result. So just to conclude, but before uh, letting you uh, sometimes for, for, for the questions, um, um, what we show in the paper is something that is interesting, um, is that we, we have these differences among countries uh, in terms of um, mortality rate um, in a nursing home, such that it seems that central and eastern country show in the same uh, words as what Pierre mentioned earlier, de deadlier nursing homes, okay? And actually these results can be related, uh, not causally, but related to some country specific features of the long-term care. Uh, we observe that the higher mortality country um, have lower spending and resources devoted to long-term care. And we also observe maybe the role of the for-profit sectors that I would say uh, need to be investigated, especially regarding, as I said in my introduction, this recent uh, evidence that has been uh, shown in this um, very nice, uh, I, I guess, very nice book, but very interesting studies uh, by journalists in France about these OPR nursing homes. So that's it. Thanks a lot, uh, Mathieu, for this uh, very nice uh, talk. Questions, comment, uh, two minutes of question, if you want. Yeah, uh, maybe, uh, Matthias, you have uh, questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, I like, I like very much the, the way you try to, uh, with this new method, to account for these unobservables, right, that might be confounding. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, another thing that I would 
love to see, and I think that's, that's like a more uh, traditional way to do it is probably just to show how big is the effect, just unconditional, and then add the observables you have and see how much goes away and how much is still left. Do you have a graph like that? No, I uh, don't. So, so yeah, no, I don't. Because if you put in ADLs, right, then a lot disappears of the initial stuff, right? I'm sure, or or. But what you mean is that doing doing uh, not doing is trying to do a matching, but uh, without uh, no, that no, set just of a lot more. Uh, just do how much higher is mortality without in nursing homes without controlling for anything. Then add ADLs, then add uh, the two diseases, and then see how how much it goes down, right? And it sort of gives you an intuitive sense of what you're after, right? I mean, your method is a lot more fancy and looks beautiful, right? It, it seems convincing to me, but. Uh, that would I would find that interesting, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a very good um, suggestion, and we, we should do that, of course. Yeah, thanks. I don't know if there is um, another question. So yes, uh, yes. Holger. Um, one uh, quick question: um, Can you be sure that the people who uh, kind of left the sample uh, are actually dead? because they could have left for other reasons, like refusing to answer the next wave or something. Okay, so um, let me, um, um, maybe if I'm not totally right, I think that uh, Jérôme or Xavier could, uh, could, could answer because they know really well share. What we use is what they, they call the end of survey questionnaire. That means that in, in share, what they do when people disappear, they try to, um, to identify basically if there is because of, of attrition or death. And if it's death, how they do that? Because uh, the share survey is a share in which we have some interviewer who go Who's in the household asking questions to the individual? So it's not a, an, online, uh, an online survey. We know directly if the people are dead or not. And we know usually from, from which kind of death uh, they actually uh, dead. So we know exactly if they're dead or not, and not if it's attrition or not. Um, so we know that. So it's really, it's really mortality rate that we have in the, in the in the data okay uh, i propose a little break on the a break of uh, 15 uh, minutes okay 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 thanks Thank a lot tatiana are you ready Yes, I'm ready. You're ready. Thanks a lot for your uh, participation. And uh, the, the floor is, is yours. All right. Thank you, Manuel, for inviting me. And um, hello from Canada. So this is um, um, joint work with Min Jun Lee at Carleton University. And uh, it's entitled Long-Term Care Choice and Equilibrium Implications for Public Policies. So our work is motivated by the high demand for long-term care, which I don't need to <laughs> convince you is high. Oh, over 70% of individuals will need, uh, retired individuals will need long-term care over their lifetime. And half of them will use paid care. Paid care is expensive, uh, whether you use nursing home or in-home care. In-home care is used extensively. Um, it can be as expensive as nursing home. And as a result, many individuals rely on public long-term care services and support programs. And in the US, the largest such program is Medicaid, which is targeting the poor. It's a means-tested program that uh, covers uh, both in-home care and uh, nursing home long-term stays. Uh, individuals who are more disabled, have no spouse, uh, live alone, or, or who reside in nursing homes are more likely to be on Medicaid. And uh, another part of uh, our motivation comes from um, US nursing home industry, which is largely run by a private sector. It's a large industry with uh, big uh, revenues uh, and over half of its uh, revenue comes from Medicaid, which reimburses uh, nursing homes at a rate below the private price. Uh, and uh, the rest of the payment, most of it comes from uh, private individuals, uh, from uh, paid out of pocket. 
the competition is limited on this uh, market because individuals don't travel too far to find the nursing home. So given that Medicaid uh, plays um, a big role on both sides of the market, on the household side and uh, nursing home side, and for both types of care, nursing home and in-home care, it, it seems logical to ask but uh, uh, when we analyze policy, it's important to take into account um, decision making on both sides of the market. And uh, that's where our contribution will be. We build on uh, two, type, uh, two kinds of literature, on the demand literature. There is a large uh, demand side uh, literature studying household decisions uh, for long-term care and uh, public policy analysis. But that literature usually takes the supply side as given. There is a supply side literature that studies nursing home optimization, but it takes the demand for nursing home in a reduced way. So what we do is to combine these two, bridge these two literatures and model both uh, life cycle optimization with old age risks where individuals make long-term care choices um, between, uh, they choose between in-home care and nursing home, and uh, this allows us to obtain a micro-founded demand for nursing home care. And then nursing homes observe this demand and decide price intensity of care and the number of beds. And this determines the cost and intensity of nursing home care, which then in turn affects household decisions, because they make them given this um, cost and intensity of nursing home care. We discipline our model with um, a rich micro, evidence, uh, micro and macro evidence on long-term care. We um, match patterns of uh, long-term care usage by health, wealth, and family status using HRS data on both extensive and intensive margin and uh, Medicaid recipiency. We use observations on the nursing home market. And then we study um, effects of uh, long-term care policies. In particular, we look at Medicaid generosity and subsidies to in-home care. And we look at the location of care, cost and intensity of care, and um, uh, make conclusions about welfare effects. Now I will briefly present the model of long-term care choice in equilibrium. Now it's a big, uh, large dynamic model. Uh, I will uh, give you uh, some intuition using a simple model. So there are uh, two types of market players there, uh, retired uh, households. There are two overlapping generations of those. They are heterogeneous, face old age risks, demand care. And uh, there are nursing home care, uh, nursing homes in on the local market um, who produce care and face identical cost structure. There is government that uh, subsidizes uh, both um, households and nursing homes. We abstract from private insurance here and focus on symmetric Nash equilibrium on the nursing home market. So uh, households are heterogeneous in age, wealth, income, health, and family status. And they face uncertainty about their health, and uh, which could ha have a high and low need for care uh, if the health is bad. And uh, family status, which may change because spouse may die and child might be available or not. The households value consumption of goods, care and bad health states and bequests. They make saving consumption and care decisions and uh, we solve their life cycle dynamic optimization problems, which I will not, uh, I will skip here. I will not give you the Bellman equation, which is huge. Now, the, as far as long-term care choice is concerned, the individuals uh, choose between in-home care and nursing home care. Uh, in-home care uh, modeled in somewhat uh, reduced way. Individuals face marginal cost uh, of care, which is uh, lower if um, there is a healthy spouse or a child nearby available. They decide how many hours uh, of care to consume. And they, uh, if there is no family available, these individuals face a fixed cost of care. Uh, for nursing home care, they just uh, choose whether they enter or not, uh, and they take intensity and prices given because it's decided by nursing homes. There is Medicaid available for the, for the poor. Uh, uh, the eligibility decided by income and assets uh, tests, and there are uh, consumption floors that um, take um, into account ex various exemptions depending on household status. 
and the coverage uh, is uh, uh, in terms of uh, number of hours it's uh, the same except it's lower for in-home care and the low need for care so it's a uh, low um, activities of daily living status uh, as a result uh, so this plays a quite uh, important role uh, caring for such individuals in nursing homes is uh, more expensive so here is a simple model this is just a static um, uh, simple model of uh, the choice of long-term care just to introduce the intuition uh, so th these indifference curves show individual preferences over non-care consumption and care intensity of care i think of hours of care uh, there are two budget uh, sets, uh, budget lines uh, drawn for uh, two types of individuals. Um, this one, the green one is uh, without family. The blue one is with family. So the individual with family can afford more care because he faces um, a lower price of uh, home care, in-home care. So if the individuals um, uh, choose in-home care, they, they um, um, care hours would be given by this point, uh, the bundles optimal consumption would be given by points C, S and F. Um, nursing homes provide a relatively high level of care. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, the, the single individual uh, is willing to pay this price. This is uh, individual wealth, by the way, um, pay this price uh, and go to a nursing home, this high level of care, because he can achieve a high utility. However, individual without a family, would choose to uh, obtain care at home. Um, however, when Medicaid is available, if consumption flow is high enough and this, um, this uh, um, individual qualifies for Medicaid, uh, we see that even individual with family will choose to go to a nursing home because uh, he's uh, made uh, slightly better off there with this uh, high level of care and he only has to give up uh, that much wealth. So that's uh, basically the idea. And uh, if we look at the entire distribution of uh, households uh, with different levels of wealth, we can show that So, give, if everything else is the same, just uh, the wealth is different, uh, the choices of individuals will break into these uh, four regions. The poorest individuals will choose Medicaid, uh, then somewhere in the middle of the wealth the region individuals will choose nursing home and otherwise they will receive um, that many hours uh, uh, at home in, in using in home care now this uh, this figure is drawn it's a snapshot for a given quality uh, sorry given intensity of care in the nursing home and given price of um, nursing home as we change price of care uh, price of nursing home stay and the intensity of care, uh, these cutoffs will uh, shift and uh, we can derive the demand for nursing home, um, aggregate demand for nursing home and uh, Medicaid, so for private individuals and the Medicaid demand for nursing home. We then go to nursing home problem um, when nursing homes um, uh, maximize their revenues that comes from private beds uh, N and uh, which are sold at the uh, price P. Um, Medicaid beds, which are compensated by the government, uh, reimbursed by the government at the rate M below the, this price. And they face uh, some costs that depend on the um, intensity of care and the total number of beds. There's some fixed cost. Uh, this uh, nursing homes uh, take uh, decisions with respect to uh, price and intensity of care of other nursing homes as given and uh, decide their own price and intensity of care as to maximize the revenues and as i said we focus on a symmetric nash equilibrium now i will say a few just a few words about the data and parameterization because i want to allocate uh, most of the time to talking about uh, uh, our experiments because I think that here people probably know very well the, the data on uh, long-term care patterns. So our uh, data comes from health and retirement studies. And uh, we um, look at the, both intensive and, int intensive, intensive and extensive margins of care usage by wealth and income quartiles, um, health status 
with uh, measured by activities of daily living uh, and uh, family status whether there is a spouse in good or fair health a uh, child nearby who can help the disabled and also Medicaid recipients. So we break down this um, usage by this, uh, all these uh, dimensions. Just to give you an idea, this is a little snapshot of uh, some of these statistics. So if you uh, hear the dark area represents individuals in a nursing home, the lighter area is uh, individuals receiving in-home care. So you can see that um, uh, highly disabled individuals receive care both in nursing home and uh, at home. Um, as well, when we look at the Medicaid recipients, there are individuals, uh, there are about 60% of individuals in nursing home who are on Medicaid, but there's also a substantial amount, uh, number of individuals with a um, uh, quarter uh, who are receiving home uh, care at home and also are on Medicaid, financed by Medicaid. Um, now, in terms of a nursing home market, there is um, so this is this data comes from the uh, Pennsylvania State Department. Uh, so individuals uh, usually don't uh, ninety percent of individuals tra don't travel more than twenty three kilometers to find the nursing home. So that gives us uh, some geographical area of uh, twenty four thousand seventy plus individuals. Uh, a quarter of eighty and over individuals need long term care. And uh, what 20% of those go to nursing homes. This market uh, covers 11 nursing homes. Uh, there are about 105 residents in each nursing home, 60% of them are on Medicaid. The price of uh, a nursing home is uh, $85,000 a year with, um, uh, with 2,000 hours uh, per individual, per resident per year. And Medicaid reimbursement rate is uh, about 90% of the uh, private price. So we take all, all that, uh, all those observations to calibrate the um, whole number of uh, parameters in this model. But uh, as I said, I would like to focus on uh, policy experiments here in the time allocated. So we'll consider two uh, experiments here. One is more generous Medicaid. This is a typical experiment you see in the demand side, side the literature that models household um, decision about long-term care. And then we introduce another uh, experiment with subsidy to in-home care for individuals without uh, family support. We look at steady states and uh, compare effects with and without nursing home response to learn to what extent it's important to model the supply side. We look at the uh, location of care and the welfare. Obviously, we are not uh, counting in uh, tax distortions, but uh, some of our conclusions go through even without this um, element. So um, and we measure consumer surplus as a lump sum wealth compensation at the, the age 70. All right, so the first experiment, uh, more generous Medicaid. So this, uh, there are, uh, we have variations of this experiment, but the, this is uh, the one I'm going to show you, where consumption floors are increased by $3,000 a year well, across the board for all uh, types of individuals. Of course, the direct effect is there are more individuals who will choose um, to go on Medicaid. The more eligible individuals and more individuals will prefer Medicaid now because it's not such a bad deal anymore. And that, that applies to both in-home and nursing home care. Now, there is also an additional indirect effect, and that's where our paper contributes is that now nursing homes face a higher demand for Medicaid uh, from Medicaid residents. Their response is to take advantage of this uh, higher demand and to actually increase intensity and price of care. Um, they kind of need to increase the price if they increase the intensity of care. Uh, what that does is attracts more Medicaid residents and uh, also uh, this is done at the cost of losing some private residents who move away from more expensive nursing homes to private in-home care. So if you look at um, uh, this um, movement, uh, obviously Medicaid, the direct effect comes, uh, uh, hits the poorest individuals. So uh, we look at the bottom uh, half of the wealth distribution, the, the lighter um, um, bars. So these individuals leave private in-home care and uh, go to Medicaid in-home care and Medicaid nursing home. This is the direct effect. 
when uh, when we keep the price and uh, intensity of care in provided by nursing homes is given now when nursing homes are allowed to respond uh, they they increase the quality of care and as a result uh, these individuals strictly prefer to go to uh, the, the, from the bottom half of wealth, they strictly prefer to go to nursing home Medicaid because it's now better quality of care. Uh, they don't go to Medicaid in home care, not so much. In addition, the private payers um, who go in the nursing home don't like this higher price, uh, even though there is also higher quality. Uh, they leave uh, nursing homes for private in home care. So this relocation turns out to be important. So if you look at um, uh, the welfare effects here, consumer surplus obviously increases, but increases way more if uh, nursing homes are allowed to respond. However, Medicaid expenditures increase even more. So overall, um, oh, and this expenditures uh, increase is driven by um, uh, this large increase in Medicaid nursing home expenditures. And uh, it, it is large as it is, but uh, when nursing homes respond, it increases even more. So overall, this is um, a bad policy. And we show that the supply side reaction here is important, that um, this increase in Medicaid claims by nursing homes is uh, making it uh, really bad. And uh, private uh, payers uh, actually lose here. Um, then the second, uh, I still have time. Uh, the second uh, experiment is in-home care subsidy. It's motivated by the fact that um, there is a high fixed cost of in-home care, that somebody has to take care of the house. So ASHU estimates that it's about $20,000 a year. So we conjecture that uh, this uh, high cost of uh, in-home care creates a barrier to the uh, in-home care use. So we propose to consider a subsidy. Uh, either as a direct cash transfer or, or uh, cover a fixed number of hours of basic custodial care. And uh, this policy, um, we, we consider uniform eligibility for um, any individual without family support. So there's no means testing here. So how, how does this work? So this is again, this is the individual who has uh, this amount of wealth, uh, Omega, has to pay fixed cost of in-home care if he uh, wants to receive care at home. And uh, his uh, budget uh, set and the preferences determine his optimal choice of this uh, in-home care. If nursing homes provide uh, this high um, uh, intensity of care and Medicaid is uh, sufficiently generous, this individual will prefer to go to a nursing home on Medicaid. Now, we introduce uh, a subsidy that is half of uh, this fixed cost. So now this individual, uh, individual's budget set expands. He can achieve this um, a utility given by the blue line. And you can see that now he's strictly better off at home on, on this subsidy rather than going uh, to a nursing home receiving um, this uh, high level of care. So th that's, uh, that's the idea on the demand side. Now, how does this play out on the supply side? So this is um, a snapshot of uh, the entire market. Suppose that wealth is the only uh, source of heterogeneity across individuals. Uh, this is a simple model illustration. Um, so this is initial allocation of care. Now, as um, Medicaid, also oh, as we introduce the subsidy, obviously in-home care becomes more attractive and um, um, some individuals uh, leave Medicaid uh, for uh, private in-home care. A number of individuals leave nursing home, uh, private nursing home, and uh, go for private in-home care with this subsidy. But now nursing homes respond because they, as they face higher competition um, and they compete with each other too for this uh, smaller pool of um, customers. So they, uh, the response is to reduce the price uh, to 80k, 80,000 dollars a year, and uh, reduce intensity of care as well. So this uh, reduction in price allows them to bring some of the um, uh, private um, payers back into the nursing home. However, this uh, reduction in quality 
makes uh, a lot more individuals leave Medicaid because it's no longer such a great deal to be in, in, on Medicaid in the nursing home. Because remember, these individuals who are on Medicaid only care about quality of nursing home because they don't face the price um, of the nursing home bed. And uh, we show that they, so this uh, affects uh, substantial, and this is what uh, drives um, the final result. So here is uh, the consumer surplus. Um, obviously increases, they're getting this uh, subsidy. Um, but uh, interestingly, Medicaid expenditure is actually uh, declining overall. So it, it, the policy costs nothing. Uh, how does that happen? If you look at Medicaid uh, expenditures, they, of course, Medicaid is giving all these transfers, they accounted for, uh, they're not means tested, but uh, as we said, uh, uniform transfers to single individuals. But their um, nursing home expenses fall dramatically, especially if we consider the response of nursing homes. The in-home care expenses uh, fall too, but not so much if we uh, account for uh, nursing home expense. And so these transfers, um, so actually this uh, fall in nursing home expenses outweighs the fall uh in trans uh, the increase in transfers so uh the takeaway is that this is a good policy there are uh, the uniform eligibility means that there are very few distortions it's easy to implement it pays for itself no extra taxes necessary so we don't need to take into account those taxes when computing the welfare benefits um care located more efficiently when consumers face the marginal price um, supply side reaction is important and we do think that this um, uh, high cost of a fixed cost of uh, um, in-home care creates a barrier of, for using this care and so the conclusion is uh, we build an equilibrium model of long-term care choice with decision <clears throat> decision makers on both sides of the market the model generates uh, a whole uh, range of long-term care patterns observed in the um, um, hrs the match the distribution of hours of care patterns of nursing home usage by um, ADL, ADL status and family status um, and by income and wealth and we match Medicaid rates uh, for in-home and nursing home care we show that uh, in-home care subsidies achieve a more efficient distribution of care at no additional cost to the government and uh, the key to this result is that the consumers might face uh, marginal price of care, and unlike uh, for the means tested Medicaid. And it's important to take uh, into account the supply side response when analyzing long term care policies, even, even if these policies only target the demand side. So that's it. I have uh, three minutes remaining. <laughs> so, any questions, I guess? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes, Pierre. Yeah, um, you you heard before that uh, in France, I mean, there is a scandal about uh, abuses in nursing home, and abuses exist also in the U.S. It's well mm -hmm. known. So the question is, how can you account for that in your model? Because clearly, abuses come from. Uh, both a market and a state failure. The state failure is because the regulation does not work well. And the market failure, it's the fact that uh, there is no good control on the quality because of asymmetric information. So my question, do you think that you can take into account uh, the, the risk of abuses in your model? <laughs> So, Pierre, this is a very good question. In fact, uh, so this is a first step, right? The way we just uh, brought in uh, nursing home uh, uh, decisions into the uh, market. Um, our, but we assume that all nursing homes are uh, homogeneous, right? They face the same cost structure and everything, and there is perfect information everywhere on both sides of the market. Now, you're right that these uh, things happen. And uh, so, it, so what we are thinking about uh, extending the model to heterogeneous nursing homes, first of all. So these nursing ho homes still have to compete, right? And it would be interesting to model private information about the quality of care they deliver. 
Uh, I think this is all on the agenda. I agree that's important. Uh, this should be uh, taken into account. Uh, definitely a good point. It's, it, it is on the agenda. Yes, this is kind of like a first baby step toward that. Uh, but uh, you're right. This is, uh, th this is exactly why we want to model nursing home decisions, because we want them to respond to government policies. And uh, it's important to know how these government policies can affect their decisions, even if uh, the government does not have um, perfect information about uh, everything that happens in the nursing home. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Yes, it's, uh, it should Thank be you. done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Matthias? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Yeah, first, impressive that you model both sides of the market. That's really quite quite amazing. I had one question. So there's this one fascinating graph where this OOP in-home care, the green area. Sorry, I can't hear you. You disappeared. Did you? I can't hear you. Did I press something? Uh, I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry. I can't hear you. Um, your headphones, maybe something. Did you? Ah, oh, sorry. Did, can anybody else hear? Him? No, Matthew? no, we cannot. I, I cannot hear him actually. You cannot hear. No, I can't hear. No, sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe you can type your question. Or... Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I have a, a, stup a stupid question, but in the in the demand side, uh, to obtain your graph, uh, you have uh, you you assume uh, individual uh, preferences. I assume, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And uh, they they depend on uh, only two goods. So here here there are okay. So where is it? So there are. To, this is a, this is a simple um, model, right? This is a, so the full model is dynamic model that uh, there are there is non-care consumption, just regular consumption. There is uh, consumption of care and bad health states, and there are bequests. So that's uh, that's it. Yeah. But uh, there's to, no leisure. To, 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 yes, yes, I, I understand. But uh, I understand the, the the graph, of course, but. To, to, to derive your result, you have no assumption on the, on the instantaneous utility of uh, oh, no, no. Uh, the, this... the two goods or you have... Uh, oh, no, no. So I, 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 I cut... Uh, we, we calibrate. Uh, so there's a, this parameterization section. I Maybe I should not have cut it so short. I thought I would run out of time. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, there is uh, there are there is a whole set of observations here on uh, long-term care usage patterns that allow us to pin down these preferences. And it's a discrete choice uh, model. There is a preference okay. shot that determines individual uh, choice of care. So observationally identical individuals will choose different types of care as it is, is what we see in the data. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, there is pattern. There is a wealth and income um, the shapes of, of this uh, usage of in-home care or um, uh, nursing home. So this, this is all that's that evidence allows us to different uh, to uh, pin down the preference parameters um okay. Medic so uh, medicaid recipiency allows us to pin down this consumption floors that uh, take um, eff effective um, um, exemptions into account so the yeah no no there is a model has lots of parameters actually and uh, all that evidence is used and there is some extra evidence that we use to uh, validate the model okay thank you you can read the the the, the question of uh, of uh, okay Matthias, if you want Matthias. yeah uh, can yeah. you hear me now i can yes. hear you now yes yeah, yeah. Ah. okay so so that's really fascinating that you have the green area embracing the the red the, the blue nursing home area and i was asking myself is that do I understand, is that driven by the symmetric Nash equilibrium assumption? And wouldn't we expect that in reality some nursing homes have incentives to cater to lower care needs, for example, by assisted living? So I understand it's very hard to do in, in your model, but uh, uh, yeah, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So I didn't quite get it. So you, you're asking. Well, so you, you're uh, focusing on symmetric national yeah, yeah, equilibrium, yeah. right? So that right. forces everybody to offer exactly the same amount of care in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. 
right. wouldn't we expect in reality that some people here try to cater to and to do some assisted living with lower intensities of care to capture so, a different market? So we check, uh, we check for deviations from uh, this uh, Nash equilibrium and uh, it's stable. It's... Uh, um, Oh, really? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's no, no incentive for these nursing homes, for some nursing homes to deviate. Yeah. Okay, okay. last question, Olga. You uh, Last question. Yeah, so, I mean, you probably selected this policy experiments because they are relevant for the US, but they are also, I, I guess they are clearly second best policies. And then the question is what it would be kind of the first best policy in this setting yes another good uh, good direction for the next step yes optimal policy would be very interesting to analyze and uh, there you might um, uh, want, want to ask question is it uh, should we provide um, care should we separate this uh, private residents from medicaid residents you could uh, go that way too the, the change the structure of uh, nursing homes um and maybe provide different level of care there i don't know there, there are many dimensions for the optimal policy to go to but uh, yeah it's it's, uh, it's also on the agenda so um that's right so this is kind of a, so we, the first experiment uh the its purpose is to basically tie to the household uh, literature that focused on this type of uh, uh policies and show how it is different in our setup the once you take into account nursing home response uh but yeah the the next step definitely optimal policy would be very interesting yeah thanks a lot tatiana for this uh, very stimulating uh, talk and uh, now chiara Kanta from uh, toulouse business school um, the floor is yours um, okay. chiara yeah, let me just should I, I share, right? Can you... So can you see my screen? Can you see my slides? Can you hear me? Uh, the problem is that I don't hear It's okay. You. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and for everybody in the audience that uh, will bear with me. So this is a fully uh, theoretical paper. So uh, and it's about uh, the gender gap in informal care and how policies should take it into account. Uh, and it's joint work with Helmut Klein and with the TSC. Uh, so this is uh, quite preliminary. So but, uh, any feedback uh, is most welcome. It's the first time I'm presenting this uh, work. Um, so, uh, well, here uh, I will not spend too much time defining long-term care and uh, um, uh, trying to motivate why long-term care is interesting to study, um, to, to be studied. And uh, so, uh, in general, well, we, we have seen it before, it represents significant financial risk, and uh, most, the main provider of care is still uh, the family. So this was also shown uh, by Kel uh, this morning, <laughs> earlier this afternoon. And uh, when you look at uh, uh, the differences, so uh, actually the family, by family we mean spouses, but also children. And uh, so typically uh, when you look at children, so we're going to focus on children in this paper, uh, daughters and daughters-in-law have been shown to provide more care than sons. So there is a lot of evidence about that. Uh, and uh, yes, so uh, this is so much the case that well, in a paper about uh, dementia, I got another say, but the, basically the best long-term care insurance is a conscientious, con quite the way to work, let not say, is a conscientious daughter. So, uh, um, so basically, why do we might have, uh, uh, why do we have maybe daughters being more involved? Well, first of all, we might have norms, well, societal norms, family norms, and also uh, lower job market opportunities for women. So uh, if women have lower uh, uh, wages, uh, they might also have a lower opportunity cost of providing informal care to their, to their parents. And of course, this is many um, 
the fact that doctors provide more informal care and are, are the biggest provider of, of informal care uh, well, after spouses uh, is that, well, these doctors will receive uh, uh, probably higher gifts and requests from parents. There is some evidence uh, showing that, but also they will work less. And uh, as uh, Pierre uh, pointed out in his, uh, in his presentation, uh, um, there is a psychological burden and a lot of hidden costs with the provision of care. So that basically the fact that women provide a lot of care might actually uh, not only exacerbate labor market uh, gaps, uh, gender gaps, but uh, might also have impact on the uh, mental health of women. So uh, all this, um, um, all this uh, should be taken into account uh, uh, by uh, long-term care policies. So the, uh, if you think about this gap in provision of care, uh, for instance, uh, you, well, you see uh, right away that basically whatever the, um, the government decides to do for long-term care might have an impact on this gap of uh, uh, informal care provision. For instance, uh, just having public transfer that are conditional on informal care provided by the family, uh, well, this transfer may actually exacerbate uh, this gender gap in provision. Uh, there is a paper about Norway uh, by Jacobson et al. that actually, uh, well, basically reports the fact that uh, uh, social, uh, basically social workers, when deciding how much public care should be assigned to different uh, um, dependent people, they take into account whether there are some there are some family members that can help them. But then, if these family members are uh, disproportionately women, then uh, basically provides uh, um, and then the the social uh, and, and these people and well basically people with daughters they have some caregiver in their home and then they receive less public care, this might even exacerbate this, uh, this gender care provision because if the state decides not to step in, daughters might be even more, um, even more, might be even more obliged or might be, might be obliged to provide, uh, to step in this. So um, in such a context where you think that not only that there is this problem of dependence that we have pointed out throughout the afternoon. But in addition to that, there is also, there are also asymmetries related to the gender of the children, for instance. Then uh, the government might have different roles when designing, might, might, might think about different uh, objectives, basically when designing uh, long-term care policy. So the first one is always to provide insurance against dependence. Uh, uh, and this role makes sense when private markets, uh, for a number of reasons that were already mentioned early on, uh, if private markets are absent or very thin. So this is uh, one of the roles of long-term care, but if there, are, if there is this gender gap, then uh, the government, uh, the, the policy might also uh, redistribute across generations, might have an impact on the distribution of the surplus between parents and children. And also, of course, across different families, which might differ um, across uh, the, the gender of the, of the children that might provide help. So uh, families with uh, daughters will be different from families with sons for a number of reasons, but also because, uh, and, and in particular, families with daughters might have, uh, um, in families with daughters, the dependent might, might receive more informal care. So um, this is basically the, the situation we have in mind. And our question is, what is the optimal policy in such a, in such a context when families differ in the gender of their children and daughters uh, for reasons that uh, I, will, uh, I will explain later, which kind of reasons we take into account, and daughters provide more informal care. So what do we do exactly? We consider a cooperative intergenerational family model. So in the spirit of Kramer and Pestio 1993, and uh, we have uh, uh, children basically that provide care and receive transfers from parents. And the decision about uh, the intensity of informal care and the transfers, intergenerational transfer, are taken cooperatively, uh, and the uh, parents and children have bargaining weight, are assigned some bargaining weights uh, uh, autonomously given. And we abstract 
from uh, the from family norms. Well, the, the bargaining weight might capture some family norms, but we abstract from the society norms that are, for instance, put forward uh, in Barigotti and Al uh, in 2020. They really look at the social norm. So uh, female uh, daughters provide care because they want to uh, fulfill some social norm. Um, so we we, con we we abstract from these uh, um, like spillovers or externalities effect. Um, daughters uh, in our model differ from sons because they have a lower bargaining weight within the family and also lower job market opportunities than sons. Uh, by when I say lower job market opportunities, it could just mean uh, lower wages. We assume that informal care and intergenerational transfers are observable and contractible by the government. So the policy can be conditional on the level of the policy that is put in place might be conditioned on informal care and the transfers. Um, well, we can discuss about this assumption. So what we have in mind is a bit like the Norwegian case where uh, basically the, the transfer from the government can be uh, where social workers can somehow observe whether there are caregivers and what they can provide in terms of informal care and they decide about the public transfer or public provision accordingly. And we will focus on two policies and try to compare them, or at least we started to compare them. A tagging policy, so a policy that is basically gender specific, so we offer um, uh, uh, some public transfers to dependent people, uh, and these transfers uh, depend on the gender of the children. And then we're looking at gender neutral policies, so uh, policies that are not conditional on gender. For a number of reasons, you might not have uh, uh, gender uh, dependent policies, in particular political reasons. So when you cannot uh, actually uh, condition your policy on the gender, uh, what is basically the, the what is the optimal policy in that case? So these are the two policies that we have. And uh, uh, since I always have a tendency to speak too much, uh, I want to give you a preview of the results. So first of all, uh, we look at the less affair, so not very surprisingly, so at what happens within the family, so at the decision within the family, and we compare boys and uh, well, families with daughters and with, uh, with sons, and uh, we, we see that transfers increase in the bargaining, transfers to children increase in the bargaining weight and decrease in the labor market productivity, and daughters always provide more informal care and they're always worse off than some sons. So they, they, they might receive a higher transfer. We cannot really say it's, 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 it's ambiguous in a model, but they might receive a higher transfer in exchange for more informal care, but this does not, still this does not compensate them fully for the uh, extra uh, informal care they provide. Then we look at the tagging policy. We show that it can decentralize the first best. So in the first best, we have full redistribution across all dimensions, uh, across states and across generations and across families. Um, and uh, the instruments we need are transfers to dependent people, so basically social long-term care insurance, uh, some transfers from uh, to young parents, so this would be like the social insurance premium, and some transfers also to children. I, I will say more later. And, um, and we find that, of course, if children have a lower bargaining weight, so for instance, if daughters have a very low bargaining weight, then transfers um, uh, to their dependent parents uh, should be um, subsidized. So, so transfers from their they are they are they are low dependent uh, their dependent parents should be subsidized, and informal care should be taxed. So you should discourage informal care from from daughters that have very low bargaining weights, while you should uh, incentivize transfers towards these same daughters. And then we turn to towards the gender neutral policy. Not surprisingly, this policy is only second best, it does not allow us to achieve the first best because now we have some IC constraints. Um, we need uh, basically we, we offer uh, the, the new policy must be incentive compatible. So now we can only reach the second best and we find some distortions both in transfers and in informal care. And I will say more later if I have time. So just briefly about uh, the model. So, well, we have taken uh, in, in previous presentation, there were basically no questions, but if there is some question about the mechanics of the model or the notation, please, I, I can take it now. 
So um, each parent has uh, one child of gender I, either the daughter or a son, we call daughters by the subscript G, we, we design daughters by a subscript G, and sons by a subscript B, girls and boys. So basically here we have basically each elderly person has only one child, which can be their daughter or child. So what, we only have two types of families, the one with one daughter or the one with one, one son. And uh, parents uh, have an exogenous income Y when young, so they live two periods. They, uh, when they are young, they receive an exogenous income, which is the same for every parent. We don't have exogenating incomes in the incomes of parents. They save uh, a certain uh, amount K and are dependent when old with probability pi. So uh, and in case of dependence, they will get some informal care A, like eight, and they might make a transfer tau to their child. So maybe it's clear if you look at it this way. Uh, so when young parents, basically they consume their exogenous income minus their savings. And then when they're old with probability one minus pi, they are healthy, they are non-dependent, and then they consume their savings. If they are uh, dependent, then they consume their savings, they just receive them, some help from their children. And in this case, they also make a transfer to their children. And uh, we assume that the marginal utility consumption is higher in the case of dependence. Uh, this ensures that there is some need for insurance. And then uh, we assume that uh, basically the benefit that uh, the, the monetary equivalent of the uh, informal care is increasing and concave in informal care. So this is pretty standard in this kind of model. And, uh, and then we look at, we have the children which just decide how much time they allocate to informal care. They have one unit of time and they just allocate it between labor and informal care. And on the labor market, they get a wage. And this is the first difference between girls and boys, between daughters and sons. Um, daughters have a lower wage than sons. So the expected utility of the child of gender I is just, well, the probability pound of pi that parent is dependent, so uh, the child receives a transfer and in exchange, he, he or she reduces uh, labor um, supply um, by A, the, the level of informal care. And with probability one month's by the father, the parents, uh, the parent is, uh, is non-dependent and then the, the, the child just consumes the wage, works uh, the whole time and, and consumes the wage. So as I said, it's a we consider a cooperative uh, uh, model. So the family maximize jointly, uh, jointly maximize uh, um, a weighted, basically a weighted average of the utility of the parent and the utility of the child. And the A alpha represents the weight that is given to the utility of the child. And Y minus alpha will be the weight for the parent. So uh, again, we assume that daughters are different um, from boys in this dimension, in the sense that girls, the daughters have a lower bargaining power within the family than boys. So maybe here it should be a lower or equal. Um, so in principle, daughters have a lower bargaining weight. So this might this might capture some mm -hmm. instance, norms, social norms. Um, uh, in a little bit now, a little bit form. So um, the optimal what what we find here when so basically the family maximizes this object with respect to informal care and transfers and intergenerational transfers. So the optimal level of informal care just equalizes the marginal benefit of informal care, gamma prime, AI, uh, and the marginal cost, which is the opportunity cost for the ch children, which is WI. This level of informal care does not depend on the bargaining weights, only on the wage. So this is actually the efficient level of informal care. We see that this is the first best level of informal care. It's just marginal benefit and equal to marginal cost. And uh, there is no reason for the family uh, jointly not to basically maximize the pie in this respect. Um, and we find, of course, that since daughters have a lower wage, they also will provide more uh, care. They have a lower marginal cost of provision. And the optimal transfer will satisfy this condition. This condition basically tells you that the marginal utilities of the parents when dependent uh, will be equal to the marginal utility of the ch children in case of dependence uh, only if the alpha uh, is equal to one alpha. So for instance, if the children have a higher weight than their parents, uh, then in the, in the, in the, in the objective functional family, then 
the marginalities of the parents will be higher than the marginalities of the children. Um, and this is important for comparisons with the first space. So basically we find that informal care decreases with the child's wage, but does not depend on the bargaining weight. This is what I already said. And also what we find is that the transfer to children tau uh, decreases uh, with their wage and increases with their bargaining weight. So this is again very intuitive, um, but this makes the comparison between the transfer to boys and the, trans the transfers to sons and the transfers to daughters ambiguous because uh, daughters have a lower wage. So this calls for a higher transfer, but they also have a lower bargaining weight, which calls for a lower transfer. So the comparison is ambiguous. What we can show, on the other hand, is that daughters are always worse off than sons. So basically, VC is always lower for, for daughters than, uh, than, for, than for sons. So even if uh, uh, the transfer to, to daughters is higher than the transfer for boys, even in, the, in, this, uh, in this scenario, uh, this is not enough to compensate for the higher informal care that they provide. So when we look at the first best, well, the, so the difference between what the family does and what the social planner does uh, is that the social planner basically maxi is utilitarian and gives the same weight to every generation and to every family. So the social planner just maximizes uh, the sum of the families with girls and boys. We assume that it's the same, uh, we are the same, that they, they are 50-50 in the population. And uh, the, basically the sum of, uh, of this utility, which attributes the one, uh, weights one half to, to the utility of the parents and of the children. So in the first place, so, well, here I didn't introduce in a sensation, but basically what, what, uh, what, I, what we had is that the, the marginal utilities are equalized across families, based on many natures and generations. So the marginal utility should be constant, irrespective of whether you're a son, a dependent uh, elderly, or a dependent or a non-dependent elderly, for instance. And uh, in the informal care, we get this expression W equal to gamma prime, which is the same as in the lesser pair. So the trade off is exactly the same as I already anticipated. So let me go move on to the first policy we analyze. So the first policy we analyze uh, is, a, sorry, is a tagging policy. So where we have gender dependent transfers. And uh, what we consider that actually decentralize, so the, the transfers we need to decentralize the first best are transfers uh, uh, are a set of transfers to dependent parents. So we would have transfers, we call them uh, TS, uh, uh, transfers to the six. Uh, TS, which is dependent on the gender. So we have a substrate A, and it is potentially a function of uh, informal care and transfers. And uh, then we would need the transfers to children on non-dependent parents. They are the ones that do not receive any transfer from their parents. So the policy includes, the optimal policy should include some transfers to non-dependent, um, to children that do not have their parents, because their parents are healthy. And then we have some transfers to or from uh, young parents. So this is T1, T in first period, and also this is gender dependent and on the gender of the, of the child. Uh, it potentially depends on the gender of the child and same potential because I will show you that we find that this, uh, that we don't need necessarily um, gender dependence for all transfers, and um, and they potentially depend again on the on the informal care and, and intergenerational transfer. So this basically is equivalent uh, uh, to a policy where the government uh, sets uh, care transfers and imposes lump sum transfer T S L H and T one. So uh, just. Here, basically, I wanted to, to have this because to show you how they, they how these uh, transfers uh, basically um, play in the in the utility of the parents. So basically, we would have a transfer for parents in, in young age, T1. This looks a bit like a premium, an insurance premium. And then parents, uh, sorry, this is basically the parentheses should close here. Uh, and then when when sick parents, they get when sick, when dependent parents, they get TS. And uh, when you look at children, uh, they get LH. When the parents are healthy, they get a transfer LH. Um, so this is basically what I wanted to show. And of course, savings, we assume that savings are still chosen freely by the family. So what are the, the results for this policy? So we find that uh, um, a gender-specific transfer 
two dependent. Uh, so the, the first best that can be implemented by a gender specific transfer TS uh, to dependent parents. So this is, we can interpret it as a long-term care benefit, and this benefit has to be a function of A and tau, or both. And uh, then there should be a gender independent lump sum transfer for young parents. So basically an insurance premium, which is uniform. It doesn't need to be gender specific. Uh, and then we find a gender specific, uh, and then we still need a gender specific transfer to children of healthy parents because they, are, they do not receive family transfers. So we cannot, I mean, in order to, be to ensure that we get to the first best uh, consumptions, meaning that they get the same marginal utility uh, in both states of the world, we need some transfer. And the first best, which also, by the way, that the first best can be decentralized by linear instruments, but I will not enter into this. So what is more interesting is, so basically we have uh, uh, lump sum transfers in the first period, which are totally independent from the gender and from the, from the transfers and care. Uh, of course, because they, they occur in the first period, so this is practical. <laughs> And then we have uh, transfers to children that only depend on the gender. They do not depend on, on the care and on the, on, on the tau. So what depends on informal care and the tau would be this uh, gender specific transfer. So the transfer would be conditional on how much informal care parents receive and how much they transfer to their children. And actually uh, we find that the marginal transfers look like this. So the derivative of the transfer with respect to the informal care, well, this would be it, and this in the first line is in marginal transfer with respect to uh, intergenerational uh, transfers. And what we find is that, for instance, you see that here, if alpha is greater than one up, if children, so maybe not, if alpha is smaller than one up, so if the child is a lower bargaining weight than the parent, this, this, uh, this expression is positive, so we should uh, subsidize transfers at the margin. While if alpha is smaller than, than one half, uh, we should basically tax informal care at the margin. So the idea is children with a lower bar low bargaining weight are kind of exploited by the parents. So in order to establish uh, uh, some equality, some equity across generation, we need to subsidize transfers and tax informal care. And the opposite is true if the children have a higher bargaining weight. So all this uh, is related to paternalism. So the parents and children consumption levels are weighted differently by the family and by the social climate. So we need to distribute, distribute, distribute across generations because uh, basically the, the social planner doesn't value utilities in the same way as the family. And then, yes. And then uh, just to conclude on the last policy we consider, we consider gender neutral policy. So all this is very nice. So all this tagging policy um, uh, leads us to decentralization of the first best, but very often these gender specific policy are not feasible politically in particular. So think about, I don't know, uh, different print suspension um, rules uh, and uh, how they are often, uh, um, how they, they, well, for instance, how they have been um, uh, kind of ruled out by the European Union. So um, what the best you can do in this case, if you cannot do a gender specific policy, you can offer a menu of contracts and then let families choose. Uh, so in order for to differentiate, to, to still be able to not to pull girls and uh, families with sons and families with daughters, the best you can do is to offer a menu and uh, make it incentive compatible so that families with daughters will choose a different policy than families with sons. So we can show that uh, when we look at the first best implementation, so the policy I just presented, if you let families choose, all families would select the policy designed for families with daughters. So basically what we have is the only binding IT constraint is the one of families with sons. So families with sons would like to mimic families with daughters. And this is also intuitive because families with daughters have fewer resources and daughters earn less on the labor market. Um, so the, what the government wants to do is intuitively is to redistribute from families with daughters to families with sons. And uh, when you look at incentive compatibility constraints, the, the under the first best uh, policy, uh, sons would like to mimic girls. So, so, sorry, families with sons would like to mimic families with girls. And so we have the same problem as before for the government, except that now, well, except that now we have an incentive compatibility constraint here, which is the incentive compatibility constraint of the boys. We want the boys to act like boys. BB, and we don't want boys to act like girls and take the, uh, the policy designed by, by girls. 
So I say boys and girls, but actually families with sons and families with dogs. So what we find, this will be basically the last uh, uh, part. So what we find uh, is that the first best solution, of course, cannot be implemented here. Informal care will be distorted down, uh, up for families with daughters. There will be the usual result of no distortion at the top for the, for the um, informal care of the sons, but there will be a uh, distortion up for families with daughters. So we will have basically uh, more informal care than in the, the first best. Remember, this was the same as the less affair. So basically, daughters will end up providing more informal care than in the less affair under this solution. And the intuition is just to relax. And the reason why you do that is to relax IT constraints, to push families with sons to actually uh, to actually uh, not mimic families with daughters. And uh, uh, the last interesting point is that um, we find that the optimal gender neutral policy still provides full insurance against the risk of dependence for both generations. Okay, so if you look at the both parents and sons, there is uh, full insurance against risk of dependence. However, so they, 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 they manage to smooth basically their marginal utility of consumption, but the allocation across generations is now distorted. So the transfer, intergenerational transfers are not the first best transfers, and they are distorted for both the, son, the, the sons and the daughters. And this is because in both cases, uh, the children and parents have different bargaining weights uh, than, in the, than, than in the social welfare function when they have the same bargaining weight. So when, uh, what we find is that when sons have a higher weight than their parents, so if alpha for sons is greater than one half, um, then parents of sons will receive a lower share of the surplus than in the first best and parents of daughters will receive a higher share of the surplus than in the first place. So you will tilt the, the transfer so that uh, families with sons will uh, prefer, um, so families with sons will go for the policy design for sons. You distort the transfers to give more surplus to the, to the sons. And since these families value more utility of the sons, they will like that. And uh, you distort the transfers for daughters so that you give more utility to parents of daughters and uh, families of boys of, with sons do not like it because they give more value to sons. So here there is a trade of basically between paternalism and incentive compatibility. Okay, so providing incentives and relaxing IT constraints is not fully compatible with paternalism. Uh, so you would like to equalize marginal utility consumptions across generations, but you cannot do it because uh, this, is, this wouldn't be incentive compatible. So I think I, I more or less on time. Uh, so um, we find that daughters are always worse off than sons in the less affair. I think this is an interesting, the interesting result of the less affair. We always find that the daughters are worse off, so they are never compensated really monetarily by for the in, in such a model for their for their extra effort. And uh, policies uh, uh, depending on gender of caregivers uh, can redistribute not only across states of the world but also across generations. And gender neutrality uh, which reduces the this type of redistribution, in particular the distribution across generations, and uh, in particular it hurts families with daughters and implies more informal care, care by daughters. And what we would like to do for future research, of course, this is a very simple model. We, we don't consider private insurance markets. So the next step would be to introduce private insurance, maybe starting with some uh, uh, um, fair insurance uh, to basically uh, see what happens. There will still be a role for the government, uh, and but it will just be more about redistribution across generations and families than uh, probably the uh, the role of the government in terms of uh, providing insurance would be less uh, 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 would be less strong. So I'm going to down. Thank you, Chiara, for this nice talk. A question uh, or comments? Yeah, can, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. you can. Yeah. You're, the, you're the chief. No, I'm not the chief. Yes. I, I want, well, Chiara, my, my, yes. intuition, my intuition is that uh, the government should try, I mean, to encourage the, the, the son to help their dependent parents and discourage daughters to do that. I mean, to try to reach a better balance in uh, informal caring between genders. 
And the reason is that uh, because of the co collateral effects of uh, caring, uh, I mean, that would be fair. Do you have that kind of result in your paper? So, yeah, so it was, it relates to this in the sense that, uh, so here it is a little bit mitigated by the fact that we, I think we have a lot of instruments that we consider, but if you just look at uh, about this, uh, so you can take care, care, in part, you can take care of the distribution between daughters and sons to transfers, direct transfers, but uh, probably it is also captured by this, um, by this. So we show that basically what the, parent, the dependent parents should get uh, when they are dependent from the government uh, is, uh, for instance, if you take daughters, if daughters are very have a low bargaining weight yeah. in the family, so you would find that uh, the transfers to daughters should be subsidized while their informal care should be taxed. Okay, so this goes exactly in your and so basically this is strongest for the for, for children in general that have low bargaining weight. So we have that. Uh, so we. I think that we, if we didn't have our transfers to children, LH, which allows us to redistribute nicely in a more direct way between daughters and sons, I think uh, the results would probably go, um, I mean, there would probably be more action here. Uh, but yes, I would say, for instance, here, it, it would be your intuition would be true in this model if uh, daughters at a bargaining weight that is higher than, uh, is lower than their parents, while sons uh, um, have a bargaining weight that is higher than their parents. But uh, so uh, this is captured a little bit by the bargaining weight. Uh, and in a way, the, whether you want to subsidize or tax informal care depends on how big is the bargaining weight of, of the child. If this bargaining weight is low, you want to to tax informal care exactly, and this would be exactly your your intuition, I guess. Thank you. Olga? Yeah, so intuitively, I, I thought the gender balances would be much uh, larger within families. So when I would set up a model, I would say, if I have a family with a girl and a boy, and then there's bargaining between the girl and the boy, who does the care, the gender imbalances would be much stronger. And the question is just why didn't you choose this setup? Is it too obvious or too difficult? Uh, no, I mean, it's, well, we simplify, yeah, we, 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 we looked at the, the simplest way that, uh, so this way you get very easy comparisons. So you don't have this extra factor for gaining within the family, but of course it, it would be very interesting to consider. Then you would consider, I think this could be also a natural uh, way to go to consider basically four types of families, <laughs> two daughters, two sons, uh, uh, no, three types of families, uh, daughter, daughter, son, son, and daughter, son, and then maybe uh, start from there. Uh, so this is a very good suggestion. And the reason why we did that is that it was just a natural, I don't know, it was more, it was simpler. It, that's, that's just the reason, but it would make a lot of sense to look at this, uh, but there, there will be more action in a way, because then there will be some spillovers from daughters to sons, and then here you would have uh, more complex functions for the for the, for the the policy, because it would depend on what you do with both your daughter and your son. The transfer from the government should depend on what you do really with, with your, within the family across children. But yeah, it's a very good point. Well, well if I... If I can just intervene, uh, you are you're right, but uh, I'm not sure if it would change a lot, actually. I, I uh, we quote uh, my paper with Francesca and Kerstin, uh, where we, uh, where it's a completely different setting because we have, uh, uh, we don't have differences in bargaining weights, but we have a social norm. And, uh, but there actually, uh, we do have a, uh, uh, either two daughters, two sons, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, or uh, the mix of the two. And actually, the uh, 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 the funny thing is that uh, uh, this makes things very complicated. And one of the referees told us that, uh, well, this is really nonsense. You should really concentrate on on, children, on families with one child. And, uh, uh, and he was actually basically right. So, so uh, or he or she. So. Uh, 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 you are right that this would make uh, uh, this would make things 
picture, but I'm not sure whether it would change a great deal uh, in the result as long as we uh, have maintained the uh, assumption of uh, uh, overall bargaining in the, in the, in the, uh, in the families. So, uh, but, but I'm not sure. So anyway, it's an interesting well, we, will, we, we should have a discussion about that. I think also it changes a bit. The, it would make heavier the, our assumption, our informational assumptions, because to make the policy base, you would need to make the policy base not only on the overall informal care that you receive, but also on the. Can you observe really whether the informal care received is provided by daughters or sons? So here it, it makes things easier in our model. To, in terms of information Even if uh, your model is, uh, is static, uh, have you an intuition of the impact of your uh, gender specific policy on the labor market and on the, 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 wedge, the wedge gap uh, between a uh, uh, daughter and, uh, and soon? Uh, so, uh, okay, let me think about that. So, in fact, uh, if I think about, well, now I'm thinking about the first best implementation, basically, and then, well, in the second best, you will have some distortion, but as long as you manage to, as long as you tap informal care, you should push women uh, to the, I mean, as long as you tap uh, informal care for women, for instance, uh, then you should uh, be able to push more women to the labor market. So I would expect a lower gap. And in terms of in terms of participation, uh, when it comes to the wage, we haven't modeled it uh, at all. So you would need what you would need probably some education as well to change that, change the productivity uh, of women on the labor market. So yeah, I. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. No, I don't have a good intuition. But if, yeah, if women have a lower bargaining weight, they, I guess they would get less education and they are younger and then lower weight. Because in the reality, but I, I, I don't know, but in the reality, uh, uh, it seems to me that the, the, the non-feasibility of, uh, of a gender-specific policy uh, come from a, a pressure of... Uh, of uh, of labor uh, of uh, I don't know the the, the, the word in uh, in English. Du uh, c'est du côté du patronat que 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 ça bloque. C'est-à-dire qu'ils ont peur que ils ont peur que si c'était trop favorable uh, aux femmes, uh, ils se retrouveraient avec un marché du travail uh, qui qui soit bi, qui qui soit pas celui qu'ils souhaitent. Okay, but so I don't this know. would be the emplo employers, so the employers lobbying yes. uh, that um, is often against this kind of gender, uh, gender conditional policies uh, because uh, they are afraid that this would, well, basically make women more, uh, so that this would make wages go up. That's what they're afraid of. Uh, frankly, I don't know. In this case, oh, yeah. it's in, uh, right. Or that's basically what you are. Um, but so, so they, they could give more bargaining bargaining power to the workers. But I don't I don't know. Uh, yes. Well, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. I okay. Can. But it, I'm not sure because you see, in, uh, we find that if uh, care of daughters is distorted upwards, so. Uh, which would, I guess, decrease their labor supply. So you would rather expect their... Uh, uh, so if you take into account the effect on uh, uh, on the labor market, their wage... Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, let's but then see. Oh, the yeah. Might oh, yeah, no, up, it's true. It would decrease their labor supply, so the wage may actually increase, yes. But there are uh, an impact on the... Is there an impact on the difference of wedge between uh, between uh, man and woman? Yeah, you're you, right. you change you change the, yes. the, the difference. The, yes. And uh, yeah. in your model, in your model, uh, all is based on the, the, the on this difference, uh, not on the level of uh, wedge, but on the difference the between difference, yeah. these, these two. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it's another question, and it's uh, not, right. not, not in your model. 
This is interesting. Uh, we, we should uh, we should think about it. And you're correct that uh, I, I was reversing the sign, but you're correct that this was probably uh, increased of women's wages, so making it gender neutral. So this would, uh, uh, but we will. Uh, it's an interesting suggestion. We will look at this. So thank you. Uh, th thank Merci. you. For, th uh, <laughs> avec plaisir. You're welcome. Uh, th thanks a lot, uh, Chiara. Uh, the last paper uh, is not explicitly uh, long-term care, but uh, it's on longevity. On, on a, a hot issue in, in, in French uh, because it's on the design of a retirement system. Uh, then uh, Jean-Marie Lozacmer. The floor is yours, Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie has disappeared. Oh. Oh. I cannot hear you. Do you do? Yes, we don't hear. Excuse you, me. Jean -Marie. It's okay. But... Is it okay now? Yes, yes, it yes it's okay. Yeah. Yes, it's okay, Jean-Marie. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, it's right that uh, this paper does not deal directly with uh, with long-term care, but. Uh, uh, is about uh, retirement policies, uh, so that longevity here will play a big role. Um, and there are a few common points with uh, the last presentation is that we take uh, gender uh, seriously into account. And uh, well, the other one uh, common point is that we share one course uh, and uh, the other course uh, is also Italian. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but um, this said, uh, so this is a paper about um, retirement system, uh, and especially. Excuse with... me, excuse me, Jean-Marie. Just, just uh, for for uh, uh, the, the, you, you. Uh, it's not very important, but Francesca is the first author on the paper, so the, not not. Yeah, I. because her family name is Canta. No, Francesca by God, C B comes before C. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So uh, you you could you mix up between between the Italians. So not all Italian women are alike. So so uh, but of anyway. Course. So yeah. so Francesca. Now just to point out that this is a mistake. So Francesca is the first author of the paper. So yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so this paper is about uh, uh, gender wage gap as uh, as the last paper, but. We we'll also uh, speak about longevity gaps uh, and their impact on the uh, optimal uh, retirement system. Uh, so let me introduce you briefly to, uh, to things you know uh, already, I guess, is uh, uh, there are two gaps when uh, considering uh, gender. Uh, one gap is longevity gap. Uh, we know that uh, women uh, die uh, um, uh, men die earlier than, than women. Um, so this difference has been uh, decreasing over the last decades, but uh, well, it continues to be quite significant. If you look at uh, the OCD uh, uh, countries, uh, we, we can observe that the uh, woman's life expectancy uh, at birth is uh, 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 actually around uh, four to six years. Um, that of men. Uh, on the contrary, there is also a wage gap in the sense that uh, men uh, have a higher wage in general, and uh, uh, women in uh, uh, this time taken in the European Union um, are um, earning 15% uh, less than, uh, than men when considering the wage per hour. Okay, so we study this, uh, we take this, this into account and uh, study uh, their implication for the uh, design of pension system uh, that will be represented by a uh, net benefit rule, uh, which is a function of retirement age, okay? Um, so we'll distinguish our result with uh, different social uh, 
uh, objective. Um, take uh, simply the utilitarian one, okay? Uh, this will lead to, uh, because of the uh, gender wage gap, some redistribution to, uh, from men to women, okay? Uh, longevity gaps will not play a role here if we are uh, purely in a utilitarian framework. Why that? It is because uh, uh, for a given uh, per period consumption and uh, the same retirement age, uh, for a, a utilitarian government, uh, giving one dollar to one or the other has the same social value. Okay. Um, but uh, we will study the case where there, is a, there will be aversion towards uh, uh, life expectancy, uh, where, where life, lifespan uh, inequality, um, in the sense that we have, will have a concave transformation of uh, lifetime utility. So that the direction of redistribution may not, uh, uh, will be ambiguous in this case, okay? Um, we have additional complication. So the first one is that we, uh, in the paper, study the case where uh, individuals may be singles or living couples, okay? So that the rules will be different here, uh, depending upon uh, the, the marital status of individuals. And uh, again, as in the last paper, we will take uh, gender neutrality into, a, in, into account, okay? Because the optimal rule, as in the preceding paper, uh, is likely to be gender specific because we, if we observe gender, uh, you observe one more characteristic so that the policy will, uh, will be more efficient by definition but we will impose gender, gender neutrality as an additional uh, requirement. Um, <clears throat> so of course, a simplistic interpretation of uh, gender neutrality here is that uh, would be, well, we have a uniform system of retirement and, uh, and that's it, okay? So that's a very simple answer to the, this question. Uh, here we adopt a more uh, sophisticated approach in the sense that uh, uh, the menu of contracts, which will be uh, retirement age and uh, pension rules, okay, uh, will be uh, self-selective, okay? Um, and more formally, uh, gender neutrality here will uh, be equivalent to say that uh, gender is not observable. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's move to uh, quickly to the model. Uh, so we we have a very simple model where where the utility of of an individual, okay, is a VT at time t at h t, okay, which is simply a uh, uh, the utility of consumption at date t uh, minus the disutility of, uh, uh, of labor. And here, uh, labor will become, as ages increase, uh, the disutility of labor will be large. Okay? So uh, we, um, we take a, a discrete approach, okay? So that per year, for example, the labor supply will be constrained to be zero or one. So here we will say one, okay? And uh, which means that um, uh, the uh, utility per period will be the utility of uh, consumption at day T minus the utility of, uh, of labor until the age where you retire, the retirement age is denoted to, Okay, and after uh, retiring, your, your uh, utility per period is simply the utility of consumption. Okay. Uh, we will assume that uh, there are perfect capital markets and certain lifetime, okay? To, just to be simple and to concentrate on, uh, on simple uh, heterogeneity stuff. 
So um, it means that the level of consumption will be uh, equalized in, in all periods, so that the life cycle utility can be uh, representative here. Uh, the, the utility can be uh, described by this equation. So uh, it's a life, li uh, lifespan T, uh, capital T, times the utility of consumption minus uh, the disutility of labor where uh, tau is uh, the retirement age, okay? Um, and people will be uh, characterized by two uh, parameters. One is the per period earnings, okay? So that uh, uh, lifetime labor income will be uh, uh, this per, per period earning times the retirement age. And uh, TC will, will be uh, the lifetime consumption. So here subscripts uh, J will refer to the gender and I will be, uh, uh, will be used to describe whether uh, the individual is single or living couple. Okay, so we assume that, uh, well, as in reality, uh, men and women uh, populate society in equal proportion and can be divided between uh, being singles or, or living couples. Okay, so the wage gap will be uh, such that, okay, the per period earnings of the female will be lower than the one of males, but uh, women will live uh, longer so that the lifespan of uh, female will be larger than the lifespan of, uh, of men. And uh, we assume that the, the utility when dead is zero. Um, and we uh, will assume that the social planner observes gender, uh, marital status, and retirement ages, but not uh, individual per period consumption. Okay. So that we will study uh, contracts defined by uh, retirement age and net pension benefit, uh, that is uh, uh, retirement age to uh, pension uh, P. So P will represent the pension benefits minus the contribution you made in, uh, during uh, working. And uh, this will be contingent on the marital status and gender when possible, okay? And uh, we will implement this by uh, uh, a pens uh, net pension rule depending on uh, the retirement age uh, taken by the individual. Okay, so in a few words, uh, what happens if uh, in a laissez-faire uh, economy like that? Well, um, we know that uh, for singles, uh, per period consumption for male will be higher than the one of female, um, especially due, uh, because of, uh, um, of the, uh, the fact that uh, male have uh, higher earnings. Uh, and uh, well, um, we don't know uh, whether women or uh, men will retire uh, uh, we don't know if female will retire le, before men or, or the contrary, uh, but uh, because of uh, substitution and, uh, and income effects, okay? Uh, but uh, as usual, uh, we, we assume that uh, substitution effects or that uh, dominate uh, income effects, so that male uh, will tend to uh, retire later. Uh, for the couple, what happens in, in a laissez-faire? Well, uh, the total income of the family will be equally, equally split between uh, the two members of the couple, uh, but men will retire later than their spouses. And this is independent of the form of the utility function because uh, consumption will be the same for the two members of the couple. Okay. Uh, so what happened in the first best uh, economy here? So we have a social welfare function, which is a concave transformation of uh, individual utilities, whether they are single or living couple. Okay, and this um, uh, 
um, transformation will be increasing and concave, okay? So that uh, you can um, model uh, utilita a pure utilitarian government by uh, V equal to zero, okay? And in this case, in, in the first best, you will have some redistribution across groups only with different income, okay? Which means that male, uh, uh, there will be a redistribution between, uh, from male to, 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 to women. Uh, now for uh, V greater than zero, uh, there will be a concern for, for distribution across groups with a different lifespan. So that in this case, uh, redistribution will be ambiguous, okay? Uh, so uh, basically that's, that's the result during the first best, okay? Uh, <coughs> on one side, if we consider only singles, uh, we have a redistribution from male to female. Okay, what counts here is the level of earnings of men, which will be, which will be lower, uh, higher than that of women. And uh, if uh, we are in the pure utilitarian setting, uh, then we'll have redistribution from men to women. Uh, however, when uh, the aversion to lifespan equality, inequality is taken into account, this redistribution may be uh, reversed. Okay, when we consider couples, uh, we'll have that redistribution will be uh, from male to female, uh, together with the fact that female will uh, take uh, their retirement before uh, uh, the, uh, the one of the men. And basically, uh, that's a laissez-faire solution, okay? So no government inter intervention here will be uh, desirable. However, when we introduce some uh, uh, degree of inequality with respect to, to, to the lifespan, then we, will, uh, we may have some redistribution from, male to, to, uh, from women to male, and uh, we'll end up with a solution with, uh, in which uh, female will retire later than men. Okay. Uh, now, what's going on with uh, gender neutrality? Uh, um, this will complicate the, the, the of course, the allocation. Um, and this will limit uh, the feasible redistribution. Uh, basically, we'll have uh, some, uh, to add some uh, constraints. Uh, which, uh, which are incentive compatibility constraints, okay? Uh, we will not be able to condition transfers uh, um, depending on the gender. Okay, so um, here we will have a bidimensional heterogeneity, which is the way uh, the earnings, uh, per, per, uh, annual earnings and lifespan, Okay, so that uh, no general single uh, crossing property can be uh, established. So that uh, either uh, for singles, either one or the other of both I see uh, incentive compatible constraints will be binding, okay? So for singles here, uh, these constraints say uh, simply that uh, women uh, do not uh, mimic uh, the contract offered to male. And the second uh, here uh, um, constraint is exactly the opposite, is that male uh, do not uh, have an incentive to claim uh, the retirement age and uh, the pension benefit offered to, to women. Okay. Um, this will be similar for couples, except that here, uh, 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 redistribution uh, will not be easy to do because, um, because basically um, uh, spouses will equally, see, equally split uh, their income, including pension, okay? Uh, and this equally, okay? 
so that the government can, cannot, uh, cannot uh, undo this. <clears throat> so what happens if we consider the second best setting, uh, we'll have different cases. Uh, for singles, we'll have uh, different cases possible according to which uh, 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 what the type of incentive uh, compatibility con constraint is binding. Um, however, if you look at the paper, in uh, our calibrated uh, simulation, um, the constraint uh, saying that MER uh, do not have to mi mimic uh, the, the allocation uh, given, uh, given to uh, female will be binding, okay? Which basically means that you, you will have to offer some uh, male, uh, some informational hands, so that gender neutrality here will impair single women. Um, for couples, uh, well, the first best allocation will be incentive compatible as long as the first best solution uh, um, is characterized by the fact that uh, women uh, retire uh, earlier than men. Okay, so which is the case if uh, uh, inequality, uh, aversion to inequality in lifespan is small enough. However, um, in, on the contrary, when uh, you want uh, in the first best that uh, female retire later than men, then the second best will involve uh, the, the same retirement age for, for, for the two members of the couple. So many will have a uniform here uh, uh, solution, okay? So here, gender neutrality will impair male uh, spouses mainly. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. Uh, my presentation was uh, fast, okay. Uh, oh no, I'm still, I'm still on time. So uh, our theoretical analysis here we, is completed in the paper by a numerical uh, uh, simulation based on the calibrated model, okay. And it, it illustrates our uh, analytical result. Uh, and um, and give some numbers um, to 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 the one uh, derived in the paper, and it especially quantifies the size of the overall uh, welfare cost imposed by the society by imposing gender neutrality, uh, as well as as its impact on the different segments of the population: male, female, singles, and spouses, and. Uh, also, in addition, we also consider uh, the more realistic case where singles and couples coexist. Okay, I think uh, that the main takeaway of uh, this paper is that uh, gender neutrality here will hurt the gender towards whom redistribution is targeted. Uh, in particular, it impairs single women and male spouses while it largely benefit uh, to uh, single men. Okay, that's it, just on time. Thanks a lot, uh, Jean-Marie. Questions, comments are welcome. Politically, uh, is it really uh, ah, oh, okay. so Olga? Sorry. Yeah. So I, 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 this is all very interesting, but I, I'm just wondering whether the results uh, are driven by the assumption that that lifespan is given because men could use income transferred to them to live longer. And wouldn't this then kind of work in the opposite direction? Uh, you would mean that uh, uh, lifespan is, uh, is endogenous here? In your, you, as, uh, maybe I under, misunderstood, but I thought it is given in your model. Yeah, it is given, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it wouldn't, if it would depend on expenditure, 
is mm -hmm. then it's not longer obvious that you should distribute away from men or well it would be the same for women so i don't think that it would change uh, the results maybe yes what, what, what makes you say that uh, 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 life expectancy would depend on uh, on the transfers I, uh, so is there any evidence but i don't know the empirical literature well but is there any evidence that higher pensions uh, lead to longer life expectancy? No, no, no. I I, I thought in at the contrary. So if let's say if a, a constant share of income is used for let's say healthcare and life extension. Then uh, and and men live considerably shorter. Then couldn't it be worthwhile to transfer income to them, because then to make to 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 make them live longer? Yeah, we have to think about this, but I don't see exactly how this would work in practice because I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, well, I don't know how, how desirable would be this policy because it would mean that also you, uh, you transfer money from women to men. So in this case, you will decrease the lifespan of women uh, by raising... Uh, so, so I'm not sure that uh, this policy will, will be desirable even in the purely, purely utilitarian case. So. Mm -hmm. But if I understand Jean-Marie, in, yeah. in your paper, longevity is exogenous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, if it were endogenous, things would yeah. be different. Okay. And uh, the objective function would be crucial. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. We agree. That's good, I mean, to, to, end, to end the session. Do, do you do, yeah. Yeah, do you know any paper who looks at endogenous longevity? Oh yeah, in yeah. a theoretical okay. Paper of Pierre, but, but we can some, talk about some that. paper of Pierre and Gregory. Uh, okay, yeah, you can, can. Can you send this to me? Yeah, I would like. I, I don't know this literature well enough, so sorry. So uh, I would be interested in seeing yeah. this. Je la, glisse, je la glisse sous ta porte dans quelques instants. Uh, yeah, but Mais I, comme c'est une littérature avec Pierre et Grégory, je ne suis pas sûr qu'elle passe sous ta porte parce qu'elle est, elle est quand même très épaisse. Ok, voilà. Non, mais Pierre, Pierre peut peut-être, ou Grégory peut me l'envoyer par mail, ce serait plus simple. Donc, parce que le... Voilà. Donc, euh... Ok. Uh, I would like to, to, to thank all the speakers. Uh, perhaps, all... Uh, just, just, I have just one remark on the last question. Uh, yes, Philippe. If you allow me, it's very, very uh, brief. The fact if, if longevity is endogenous, nevertheless, probably when considering the point which has been made by, uh, by uh, uh, Lozak Meur, uh, <laughs> The, the timing of both problems are relatively different because the consequence on longevity will be very, very long term, while the consequence on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on redistribution and uh, et cetera will be probably medium term and not as much long term as for uh, longevity. And therefore, we have a transition path, which probably is uh, is more complex to design. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Philippe. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, then uh, I would like to, to thank all the speakers and uh, all the, the participants for this uh, very, very stimulating uh, session. I thank, uh, of course, uh, the, the score, the Foundation score. And uh, I want uh, to thank Florence and Valérie for their uh, remarkable uh, work, their uh, organization skills are a considerable uh, asset for uh, the Toulouse School of uh, Economy. Yes, and Pierre, and I... if, you, if you want to conclude, or Philippe, if you want to conclude, uh, the floor is yours. Maybe a few remarks before Pierre, because Pierre has to conclude his. Uh, but I will thank also all the, the, the speakers and also all, all the participants for their, for their question. And I think it's very and highly stimulative. There are empirics and theorics have something to, to provide to us, and, uh, and we have to think about it even on the side of, of the business, because you're, the problem you have been raising, for example, the last question is a, is a tremendous question when managing uh, an insurance company. And, uh, and of course, we will, we will discuss with Tessa um, um, if we can, uh, of course, make the, 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 uh, the workshop uh, public by, by providing uh, uh, the, the, the discussion and, uh, and all the, the, the pictures. And, uh, and I don't know if it is possible to have uh, the, the presentation made also public, but just uh, the question will be probably raised on the other side because we want all these kind of, of document uh, to, to, to be as much as possible public. Um, but of course, if you think that your research is not sufficiently advanced, then uh, it will not be possible. But I leave the floor to, to Pierre. <laughs> well, I don't need the floor. Uh, let me say that uh, after, I mean, having heard these uh, six uh, Fast, well, I mean, I must say five fascinating papers. <laughs> uh, I can say six. <laughs> my feeling is that there is much to do. Uh, we still have much to do. And particularly, I mean, he didn't things. listen to himself. That's why he says five. So he wasn't listening when he was talking. <laughs> it's a reason why I can say six myself. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. I can count on you. Uh, no. I think that one of the big issues, I'm sorry to come back on that, is the issue of abuse. I mean, the quality. And by the way, I think we should look not only at the abuse in the nursing homes, but there is also abuse in families. Because, of uh, course. and Pechi, when you have a subsidy transfer to the family, I mean, there is a lot of uh, strategy which can end up, I mean, keeping the uh, dependent person in a closet and the rest of the family benefiting from the from the transfers. I mean, that's not unusual, unfortunately. And the question, I mean, is uh, how can we get a good regulation process? I mean, to try to control abuse, both in the nursing home and in families. And maybe, Pierre, differentiating nursing home, which are profitable, a non-profit nursing home, because we are in, in a sector where both are operating and relatively dynamic. And therefore, if something is possible also on, on that point, it's interesting, then we can look at what competition is providing and then sure. what profit is providing or not providing. <laughs> okay, so I think we should stop here. Thanks to everyone and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, goodbye. Thank bye you bye. to the organizers for the conference. It was great. Bye bye, Tatiana. Bye bye. <laughs>